preface of the haunted hour an anthology by margaret wiedemer this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by nemo preface of the haunted hour by margaret wiedemer this does not attempt to be an inclusive anthology the ghostly poetry of the late war alone would have made a book as large as this and an inclusive scheme would have ended as a six-volume encyclopedia of ghostly verse i hope that this may be called for some day the present book has been held to the conventional limits of the type of small anthology which may be read without weariness i hope by the exclusion not only of many long and dreary ghost poems but many others which it was very hard to leave out i have not considered as ghost poems anything but poems which related to the return of spirits to earth thus the blessed damoiselle a poem of spirits in heaven la belle dame son merci whose heroine may be a fairy or witch and whose ghosts are presented in dream only do not belong in this classification nor do such poems as matilda blind's lovely sonnet the dead are ever with us class as ghost poems for in these the dead are living in ourselves in a half metaphorical sense if a poem would be a ghost story in short i have considered it a ghost poem not otherwise in this connection i wish to thank mabel cleland ludlam for unwearied and intelligent assistance with the selection and compilation of the book and aline kilmer for help in its revision and arrangement margaret wiedemer end of preface of the haunted hour section one of the haunted hour an anthology by margaret wiedemer this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. The Faraway Country by Nora Hopper Chesson. Far away's the country where I desire to go. Far away's the country where the blue roses grow far away's the country and very far away and who would travel thither must go twixt night and day far away's the country and the seas are wild that you must voyage over grown man or chrism child o'er leagues of land and water a weary way you'll go before you'll find the country where the blue roses grow but o oh and o oh, the roses are very strange and fair you'd travel far to see them and one might die to wear yet far away's the country and perilous the sea and some may think far fairer the red rose on her tree far away's the country and strange the way to fare far away's the country o oh, would that i were there it's on and on past Winnie Muir and over brig a dread and you shall pluck blue roses the day that you are dead end of section one section two of the haunted hour an anthology by margaret wiedemer this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by nemo the nicht between the sanks and souls part one all souls by catherine tynan the door of heaven is on the latch tonight and many a one is fain to go home for one night's watch with his love again oh 
where the father and mother sit there's a drift of dead leaves at the door like pitter-patter of little feet that come no more their thoughts are in the night and cold their tears are heavier than the clay but who is this at the threshold so young and gay they are come from the land o oh, the young they have forgotten how to weep words of comfort on the tongue and a kiss to keep they sit down and they stay a while kisses and comfort none shall lack at morn they steal forth with a smile and a long look back all saints eve by lizette woodworth reese oh when the ghosts go by under the empty trees here in my house i sit and cry my head upon my knees innumerable white like mists they fill the square the bolt is drawn the latch made tight the shutter barred there there walks one small and glad new to the churchyard clod my little lad my little lad a single year with god i sit and hide my head until they all are past under the empty trees the dead that go full soft and fast up to my chamber dim back to my bed i plod oh would i were a ghost with him and faring back to god a dream by william allingham i heard the dogs howl in the moonlight night i went to the window to see the sight all the dead that i ever knew going one by one and two by two on they passed and on they passed towns fellows all from first to last born in the moonlight of the lane quenched in the heavy shadow again schoolmates marching as when they played at soldiers once but now more stayed those were the strangest sight to me who were drowned i knew in the open sea straight and handsome folk bent and weak too some that i loved and gasped to speak to some but a day in their churchyard bed some that i had not known were dead a long long crowd where each seemed lonely yet all of them there was one one only raised a head or looked my way she lingered a moment she might not stay how long since i saw that fair pale face ah mother dear might i only place my head on thy breast a moment to rest while thy hand on my tearful cheek were pressed on on a moving bridge they made across the moonstream from shade to shade young and old women and men many long forgot but remembered then and first there came a bitter laughter a sound of tears a moment after and then a music so lofty and gay that every morning day by day i strive to recall it if i may the neighbors by theodosia garrison at first cock crow the ghost must go back to the quiet graves below against the distant striking of the clock i heard the crowing cock and i arose and threw the window wide long long before the setting of the moon and yet i knew they must be passing soon my neighbors who had died back to their narrow green roofed homes that wait beyond the churchyard gate i leaned far out and waited all the world was like a thing impearled mysterious and beautiful and still the crooked road seemed one the moon might play our little village slept in quaker gray and gray and tall the poplars on the hill and then far off i heard the cock and then my neighbors passed again at first it seemed a white cloud nothing more slow drifting by my door or garden lilies swaying in the wind then suddenly each separate face i knew the tender lovers drifting two and two old peaceful folk long since passed out of mind 
and little children, one whose hand held still, an earth-grown daffodil. And here I saw one pausing for a space, to lift a wistful face, up to a certain window, where there dreamed a little brood left motherless, and there one turned to where the unploughed fields lay bare, and others lingering past, but one there seemed so over glad to haste she scarce could wait to reach the churchyard gate. The farrier's little maid who loved too well and died, I may not tell how glad she seemed. My neighbors, young and old, with backward glances lingered as they went only upon one face was all content a sorrow comforted a peace untold i watched them through the swinging gate the dawn stayed till the last had gone a ballad of halloween by theodosia garrison all night the wild wind on the heath whistled its song of vague alarms all night in some mad dance of death the poplars tossed their naked arms mignon isa hath left her bed and bared her shoulders to the blast the long procession of the dead stared at her as it passed oh there methinks my mother smiled and there my father walks forlorn and there the little nameless child that was the parish scorn and there my olden comrades move and there my sister smiles apart but nowhere is the fair false love that bent and broke my heart oh false in life oh false in death wherever thy mad spirit be could it not come this night she saith and keep tryst with me mignon isa has turned alone bitter the pain and long the years the moonlight on the old grave's stone was warmer than her tears all night the wild wind on the heath whistled its song of vague alarms all night in some mad dance of death the poplars tossed their naked arms the forgotten soul by margaret Readmer. twas i that cried against the pain on all souls night o oh, pulse of my heart's life how could you never hear you filled the room i knew with yellow candlelight and cheered the lass beside you when she cried in fear twas i that went beside you in the gray wood mist o oh, core of my heart's heart how could you never know you only frowned and shuddered as you bent and kissed the lass hard by you hand fast as i used to go Twas I that stood to greet you on the churchyard pave. O oh, fire of my heart's grief, how could you never see? You smiled in careless dreaming as you crossed my grave, and hummed a little love song where they buried me. All Souls Night by Dora Sigerson. O oh, mother, mother, I swept the hearth, I set his chair and the white board spread. I prayed for his coming to our kind lady when death's doors would let out the dead. Strange wind rattled the window pane, and down the lane a dog howled on. I called his name, and the candle flame burnt dim, pressed a hand the door latch upon. Delish, delish, my woe forever that I could not sever coward flesh from fear. I called his name, and the pale ghost came but i was afraid to meet my dear o oh, mother mother in tears i checked the sad hours past of the year that's o'er till by god's grace i might see his face and hear the sound of his voice once more the chair i set from the cold and wet he took when he came from unknown skies of the land of the dead on my bent brown head i felt the reproach of his saddened eyes I closed my lids on my heart's desire, crouched by the fire, my voice was dumb. At my clean-swept hearth he had no mirth, and at my table he broke no crumb. Delish, delish, my woe forever, that I could not sever, coward flesh from fear. His chair put aside when the young cock cried, and I was afraid to meet my dear. 
End of section two. Section three of the Haunted Hour, an anthology by Margaret Wiedemer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. The Nicht Between the Sanks and Souls, Part Two. Janet's Tryst by George MacDonald. Sweep up the floor, Janet. Put on another peat. It's alone in starry nicht, Janet, neither cold nor wheat. And it's open hoose we keep the nicht, for only that may be oot. It's the nicht atween the sonks and souls, when the boldest gang aboot. Set the chairs back to the wall, Janet, Macready for quite folk. Hey, a thing as clean as a winding sheet, becoming a ilk oak. There's a spare up all the flue, Janet, and there's a roan berry. Sweep them into the fire, Janet. They'll be welcomer than Mary. Seen set open the door, Janet, wide open for what kins wa. As you come to your bed, Janet, set it open to the wall. She set the chairs back to the wall, but ain't made of the back. She swept the floor, but left any spare, a long spare old ache. The neat was lone, and the stars sat still, a glint in doon the sky. And the souls crept out o oh, their moly graves, I think would lie and by. When midnight came the mither rays, so a gay see and hear. Back she came with a glowing face, and slumin with very fear. There's ain o' them sittin' afore the fire, Janet, gay now to see. Ye left a chair for the fire, while I told ye nae chair should be. Janet, she smiled in her meadow's face, she had brunt the rod and breed, and she left aneath the birken chair, the spare frae a coffin lid. She raised and she gaed aboot the hoose, I steekin' door and door. Three hours gaed by ere her mother heard, her feet upon the floor. But one the grey cock crew she heard, the sound o' Shula's feet. One the red cock crew, she heard the door, on a sow o wind and wheat. On Janet come back, we a wan face, but never a word said she. No man ever heard her voice lood out, and calm like fray o'er the sea. And no man ever heard her lach, nor yet say last nor we, but a smile I glimmered on her wan face, like the moon looked on the sea. And ilk nicht twixt the songs and souls, wide open she set the door, and she mended the fire, she left a chair, and that spale upon the floor. And at midnight she gaed with the hoose, I steekin' door and door. When the red cock crew, she come bend the hoose, I wanted them before. Wanna her face and sweeter her smile, to the seventh all souls eve. Her meter, she heard the shoeless feet, says she's coming, I believe. But she come na ben, and her meter lay, for fear she could not stand. But up she raised, and ben she gaed, when the golden cock had grown. And Janet sat upon the chair, white as the day did door. Her smile was the sunlit left on the sea, one the sun has gained a war. Hallows Inn by Winifred M. Latz The girls are laughing with the boys and gaming by the fire. They're wishful, every one of them, to see her heart's desire. Twas Thesi cut the barn brack and found the ring inside. Before next Hallows Inn has dawned, herself will be a bride but little molly stands alone outside the cabin door and breaks her heart for one the waves threw dead upon the shore twas katie's nut leapt from the hearth and left poor pats alone but ellen stayed by christy bairns upon the wide hearthstone and all the while the child her bobbed for apple set afloat 
the old men smoked their pipes and talked about the foundered boat but molly walked upon the cliff and never feared the rain she called the name of one she loved and bid him come again young peter pulled the cabbage stump to win a wealthy wife rosanna threw the apple peel to know who'd share her life and lizzie had a looking-glass she'd hid in some dark place to try if there for an inst her own she'd see her comrade's face but molly walked along the quay where terry's feet had trod and sobbed her grief out in the night with no one near but god she heard the laughter from the house she heard the fiddle played she called her dead love to her side why should she be afraid she took his cold hands in her own she had no thought of dread and not a star looked out to watch the living kiss the dead the lads are gaming with the girls and laughing by the fire but molly in the cold dark night has found her heart's desire on kingston bridge by ellen m h cortezas on all souls night the dead walk on kingston bridge old legend on kingston bridge the starlight shone through hurrying mist and shrouded glow the boating night wind made its moan the mighty river crept low twas all souls night and to and fro quick and dead together walked the quick and dead together talked on kingston bridge two met who had not met for years once was their hate too deep for fears one drew his rapier as he came up leapt his anger like a flame with clash of mail he faced his foe and bade him stand and meet him so he felt a graveyard wind go by cold cold as was his enemy a stony horror held him fast the dead looked with a ghastly stare and sighed i know thee not and passed like to the mist and left him there on kingston bridge twas all souls night and to and fro the quick and dead together walked the quick and dead together talked on kingston bridge two met who had not met for years with grief that was too deep for tears they parted last he clasped her hand and in her eyes he sought love's rapturous surprise oh sweet he cried hast thou come back to say thou lovest thy lover still into the starlight pale and cold she gazed afar her hand was chill dost thou remember how we kept our ardent vigils how we kissed take thou these kisses as of old an icy wind about him swept i know thee not she sighed and passed into the dim and shrouding mist on kingston bridge twas all souls night and to and fro the quick and dead together walked the quick and dead together talked on kingston bridge all souls night by louisa humphreys canis the priest went out on the night of souls stay o oh, stay said the woman who served his board stay for the path is straight with pits and holes and the night is dark and the way is lone abroad stay within because it is lone at least nay it will not be lone said canis the priest dim without in a dim low sweeping sky a scent of earth in the night of opened mould a listening pause in the night and a breath passed by and its touch was cold was cold as the graves are cold canis went on to the waste where no men be nay i will not be lone to-night said he shades that flit besides the shades of the night rustling sobs besides the sobs of the wind steps of feet the pace with his on the right steps the pace on the left and steps behind nay no fear that i shall be lone at least lo there are throngs abroad said canis the priest deathly hands that pluck at his cassock's hem sighings of earthly breath that smite his cheek canis the priest swings on a tune with them hears the throbbings of pain 
and hears them speak hears the word they utter and answers yea yea poor souls for i heed i pray i pray lo a gleam of gray and the dark is done hark a bird that trills a song of the light canis hies him home by the shine of the sun what to-day of those pallid wraiths of the night what of the woeful notes that had wailed and fled maria ora pro illis canis said End of section three. Section four of The Haunted Hour, an anthology by Margaret Whittemar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annalisa Bodker All the Little Sighing Souls Part 1 Mary Shepherdess by Marjorie L. C. Pickthall When the heron's in the high wood And the last long furrow sown With the herded cloud before her And her sea-sweet raiment blown Comes Mary, Mary Shepherdess a seeking for her own. St. James, he calls the righteous folk. St. John, he calls the kind. St. Peter seeks the valiant men all to loose or bind. But Mary seeks the little souls that are so hard to find. All the little sighing souls, born of dust despair, they who fed on bitter bread when the world was bare. Frighted of the glory gates and the starry stair. All about the windy down, housing in the ling, Underneath the alder bough, linnet light they cling. Frighted of the shining house where the martyrs sing. Crying in the ivy bloom, fingering at the pane, Grieving in the hollow dark, lone along the lane. Mary, Mary Shepherdess, gathers them again and oh the wandering women know in workhouse and in shed they dream on mary shepherdess with doves about her head and pleasant posies in her hand and sorrow comforted saying there's my little lass faring fine and free there's the little lad i laid by the holly tree dreaming there's my nameless bairn laughing at her knee when the bracken harvest gathered and the frost is on the loam when the dream goes out in silence and the ebb runs out in foam mary mary shepherdess she leads the lost lambs home if i had a little maid to turn my tears away if i had a little lad to lead me when i'm gray all to Mary Shepherdess, they'd fold their hands and pray. All the Little Sighing Souls The Little Ghost by Catherine Tynan The stars began to peep, gone was the bitter day. She heard the milky ewes bleat to their lambs astray. Her heart cried for her lamb lapped cold in the churchyard sod. She could not think on the happy children at play with the Lamb of God. She heard the calling ewes and the lambs answer, Alas! She heard her heart's blood drip in the night as the ewes milk on the grass. Her tears that burnt like fire, so bitter and slow ran down. She could not think on the new-washed children playing by Mary's gown. Oh, who is this comes in over her threshold stone? And why is the old dog wild with joy, who all day long made moan? This fair little radiant ghost, her one little son of seven, new scaped from the band of merry children in the nurseries of heaven. He was clad all in white, without a speck or stain. 
his curls had a ring of light that rose and fell again. Now come with me, my own mother, and you shall have great ease, for you shall see the lost children gathered at Mary's knees. Oh, lightly sprang she up, nor waked her sleeping man, and hand in hand with the little ghost through the dark night she ran. She is gone swift as a fawn, as a bird homes to its nest. She has seen them lie, the sleepy children, twixt Mary's arm and breast. At morning she came back, her eyes were strange to see. She will not fear the long journey, however long it be. As she goes in and out, she sings unto herself, for she has seen the mother's children and knows that it is well. All the Little Sighing Souls Two Brothers by Theodosia Garrison The dead son's mother sat and wept, and her live son plucked at her gown. O oh, mother, long is the watch we've kept, but she beat the small hands down. The little live sung, he clung to her knee, and frightened his eyes and dim. Have ye never, my mother, a word for me? But she turned her face from him, saying, Oh, and alack, mine own dead son, could I know but the path aright, how fast and how fast my feet would run through the way of death to-night, saying, Oh, and alack for thy empty place, and the ache in my heart to hide. The little live son has touched her face, but she thrust his hands aside. The mother hath laid her down and wept in the midnight's chill and gloom. In the hour ere dawn, while the mother slept, the ghost came in the room. And the little live son hath called his name, or ever he passed the door. O oh, brother, brother, tis well ye came, for our mother's grief is sore. O oh, brother, brother, she weeps for thee as a rain that beats all day. But me, she pushes from off her knee and turneth her eyes away. And the little dead son, he spake again. My brother, the dead have grace, though they lay them low from the sight of men with a white cloth on their face. O oh, brother, the dead have gifts of love, though lonely and low they lie. By my mother's love do I speak and move, and may not wholly die. The little live son, he sighed apart. O oh, brother, ye live, quoth he, in my mother's grief and my mother's heart and my mother's memory. And vain for thee is my mother's cry, the little live son hath said. For ye are loved, and ye may not die. It is only I who am dead. All the Little Sighing Souls The Little Dead Child by Josephine Dascom Bacon when all but her was sleeping fast, and the night was nearly fled, the little dead child came up the stair and stood by his mother's bed. Ah, God, she cried, the nights are three, and yet I have not slept. The little dead child, he sat him down and sank his head and wept. And is it thou, my little dead child? Come in from out the storm. I'll lie thou back against my heart, and I will keep thee warm. That is long ago, mother, long and long ago. Shall I grow warm, who lay three nights beneath the winter snow? Hast thou not heard the old nurse weep? She sings to us no more, and thy brothers leave the broken toys and whisper in the door. That is far away, mother, 
far and far away. Above my head the stone is white, my hands forget to play. What wilt thou then, my little dead child, since here thou mayst not lie? Ah, me, that snow should be thy sheet, and winds thy lullaby. Down within my grave, mother, I heard, I know not how. Go up to God, thou little child, go up and meet him now. That is far too fair, mother, far and far too fair. I come for thee to carry me the way from here to there. O oh, hold thy peace, my little dead child, my heart will break in me. Thy way to God, thou must go alone. I may not carry thee. The cock crew out the early dawn, ere she could stay her moan. She heard the cry of a little child upon his way alone. End of section four. Recording by Annalisa Bodker. Section 5 of The Haunted Hour, an anthology by Margaret Widemar. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Annalisa Bodker. All the Little Sighing Souls. Part 2. THE CHILD by Theodosia Garrison I heard her crying in the night. So long, so long I lay awake, watching the moonlight ebb and break against the sill like waves of light. I tried to close my eyes nor heed and lie quite still, but oh again, the little voice of fright and pain sobbed in the darkness of her need. Strange shadows led me down the stair, creaked as I went the hollow floor. I drew the bolt and flung the door, wide, wide, and softly called her there. Ah, me, as happy mothers call, through the tender twilight to the gay, glad truant making holiday, too long before the even fall. The garden odors drifted through, the scent of earth and box and rose, and then, as silently as those, a little wistful child I knew. So small, so frightened, and so cold, ah, close, so close I gathered her, within my arms she might not stir, and crooned and kissed her in their hold. As might a happy mother when, Aghast for some quaint trifling thing, one runs to her for comforting and smiles within her arms again. All night upon my heart she lay, all night I held her warm and close, until the morning wind arose and called across the world for day. The garden odors drifted through the open door as still as they, she passed into the awful day. A little wistful child I knew. Think you for this God's smile may dim. His are so many, many dead. Seeing that I but comforted a child and sent her back to him. All the Little Sighing Souls Such are the Souls in Purgatory by Anna Hempstead Branch Three days she wandered forth from me and sought me as of old. I did not know how dark t'would be, she sobbed, nor yet how cold. And it is chill for me to fare, who have not long been dead. If thou wouldst give away thy cloak, I might go comforted. I would have soothed her on my breast, but that she needs must go. The dead must journey without rest, whether they will or no. But I had kept for love of her the cloak she wore, the shoes, and every day I touched the things she had been wont to use. 
all night the dead must hurry on they may not ever sleep and so i gave away her cloak that i was fain to keep the second time she sought me out her eyes were full of need if thou wouldst give away my shoes perchance i would not bleed i cried to her aloud my child they are all i have to keep to lay my hand upon and touch at night before i sleep the earth shall keep the body i bore and heaven thy soul i may not choose let be i ask a little thing that i should keep thy shoes but i will give away my own lord lord wilt thou not see let thou her road to paradise this way be eased by me all night alone by briar and stone i ran the road unshod so i might know instead of her the pains that lead to god when next she came for a brief space she tarried at my side so happy was she in that place so glad that she had died the last night that i roamed she said someone had gone before i followed where those feet had led and found it rough no more and then i came to a good place so kind so dear are they i may not come again and so she smiled and went away dear christ who died to save us all who trod the ways so cold and wild the love of mary in thy heart did let me ease my child she may not leave the place of bliss i may not touch her hands and hair but every night i touch and kiss the shoes she used to wear all the little sighing souls the open door by rosamund marriott watson O oh, listen for her step when the fire burns hollow, when the low fire whispers and the white ash sinks, when all about the chamber shadows troop and follow, as drowsier yet the hearth's red watchlight blinks, while bare black night through empty casements staring waits to storm the wainscot till the fire lies dead, fast along the snowbound waste little feet are faring, hush and listen listen but never turn your head leave the door upon the latch she never could reach it you would hear her crying crying there till break of day out on the cold moor mid the snows that bleach it weeping as once in the long years passed away lean deeper in the settle corner lest she find you find and grow fearsome too afraid to stay do you hear the hinge of the oaken press behind you there all her toys were kept there she used to play do you hear the light light foot the faint sweet laughter happy stir and murmur of a child that plays slowly the darkness creeps up from floor to rafter slowly the fallen snow covers all the ways falls as it once fell on a tide passed over golden the hearth glowed then bright the window shone and still she comes through the sullen drifts above her home to the cold hearth though all the lights are gone far or near no one knew none would now remember where she wandered no one knew none will ever know somewhere spring must give her flowers somewhere white december calls her from the moorland to her playthings through the snow all the little sighing souls my laddie's hounds by marguerite elizabeth easter they are my laddie's hounds that rin the wood at break o day what is it takes them hunts can ony say what is it takes my laddie's hounds at break o day? They click half together and then fa back with room atween, for ain the walk set off and I ha seen, the baith click off together with ain atween. And when toward the pines up yonder lane they loop a line, 
I see a laddie brent and strang. I see a laddie loop along toward the pines. I follow them in mind, look time, right well I kin the way. They thread the wood and spill the stainy bray, and scour the field, I follow them, I ken the way. They daddle at the creek, we're down for aught the reaching logs. I stoop with my dear laddie and the dogs, and drink of springs that spit the creek, mess to the logs. He's but the bairn, although he hunts the mountain's lonely bree. His doggy's ears abun their brows with glee. He ties. He's but a bairn, although he hunts the bree. For length they are stretch out upon a bank that green trees hap in shade. He whistles soft, the beagle snap, with een half shut a stretching out where green trees hap. And no he fades away. For a tween the twa into the blue, my sight gets blind. Good Lord, it is not true, for he has gained for I away into the blue. They are my laddy sounds that make the hill and fall a day with dowie heads hung lay. Can Oni say, what is it hunts my laddy sounds to fall a day? All the Little Sighing Souls The Old House by Catherine Tynan The boys who used to come and go In the gray, kindly house are flown. They have taken the way the young feet know. Not alone, not alone. Thronged is the road the young feet go. Yet in the quiet evening hour, what comes, O oh, lighter than a bird? Touches her cheek, soft as a flower. What moved, what stirred? What was the joyous whisper heard? What flitted in the corridor, like a boy's shape, so dear and slight? What was the laughter ran before, delicate, light? Like harps the wind plays out of sight. The boys who used to come and go, in the gray house are come again. Of the gray house and firelit room, they are fain, they are fain, they have come home from the night and rain. End of section five. Recording by Annalisa Bodker. Section number six of The Haunted Hour, an anthology by Margaret Widemer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matt Benzing, Oxford, Ohio. Shadowy Heroes Ballad of the Buried Sword by Ernest Rise In a winter's dream, on Gamlin Moor, I found the lost grave of Lord Glyndwar. I followed three shadows against the moon that marched while the thin reed whistled the tune. Three swordsmen they were out of Harry's wars that made a Welsh song of their Norman scars. But they sang no longer of Agincourt when they came to a grave, for there lay Glyndwar. Said the one, My sword, thou art rust, my dear, I but brought thee home to break thee here. And the second, Aye, here is the narrow home to which our tired hearts are come. And the third, We are all that are left, Glyndwar, to guard thee now on Gamlin Moor. Straightway I saw the dead forth stand, his good sword bright in his right hand, and the marsh reeds with a whistling sound to a thousand gray swordsmen were turned around. The moon did shake in the south to see the dead man stand with his soldiery. But the brighter his sword, the grave before, turned its gate of death to a radiant door. Therein the thousand before their lord marched at the summons of his bright sword. 
Then the night grew strange, the blood left my brain, and I stood alone by the grave again. But brightly his sword still before me shone across the dark moor as I passed alone. And still it shines, a silver flame, against the dark of the Cumriac shame. The Looking Glass by Rudyard Kipling the queen was in her chamber, and she was middling old. Her petticoat was of satin, and her stomacher was gold. Backwards and forwards and sideways did she pass, making up her mind to face the cruel looking glass. The cruel looking glass that will never show a lass as comely or as kindly or as young as what she was. The queen was in her chamber, a combing of her hair. There came Queen Mary's spirit, and it stood behind her chair, singing, Backwards and forwards and sideways may you pass, but I will stand beside you till you face the looking glass, the cruel looking glass that will never show, alas, as lovely or unlucky or as lonely as I was. The queen was in her chamber, a weeping very sore. Then came Lord Leicester's spirit, and it scratched upon the door, singing, Backwards and forwards and sideways may you pass, but I will walk beside you till you face the looking glass, the cruel looking glass that will never show a lass as hard and unforgiving and as wicked as you was. The queen was in her chamber, her sins were on her head. She looked the spirits up and down, and statily she said, Backwards and forwards and sideways though I've been, yet I am Harry's daughter, and I am England's queen. And she faced the looking glass, and whatever else there was, and she saw her day was over, and she saw her beauty pass. In the cruel looking glass that can always hurt a lass more hard than any ghost there is, or any man that was. Drake's Drum by Henry Newbolt Drake is in his hammock and a thousand miles away. Captain, art thou sleeping there below? Slung atween the round shot in Nambla Dios Bay and dreaming all the time of Plymouth Hoe. Yonder looms the island, yonder lie the ships, with sailor lads a dancing heel and toe, and the shore light flashing, and the night tide dashing, he sees it all so plainly as he saw it long ago. Drake, he was a Devon man and ruled the Devon seas. Captain, art thou sleeping there below? Roving though his death fell, he went with heart of ease and dreaming all the time of Plymouth Hoe. Take my drum to England, hang it by the shore. Strike it when your powder's running low. If the dawn sight Devon, I'll quit the port o' heaven and drum them up the channel as we drummed them long ago. The lake he's in his hammock till the great armadas come. Captain, art thou sleeping there below? Slung atween the round shot, listening for the drum and dreaming all the time of Plymouth Hoe. Call him on the deep sea, call him up the sound. Call him when ye sail to meet the foe. Where the old trade's plyin' and the old flag flyin', they shall find him where and waken as they found him long ago. The Grey Ghost by Francis Carlin From year to year there walks a ghost in grey through misty Connemara in the west, and those who seek the cause of his unrest need go but to the death dumb in the clay, to those that fell defiant in the fray among the boggy wilds of Ireland, blessed by Cromwell, when his puritanic jest left hell and Connaught open on their way. As I have heard, so may the stranger hear, that he who drove the natives from the lawn must wander o'er the marsh and foggy fen, until the Irish gather with a cheer in Dublin of the Parliaments at dawn. God rest the ghost of Cromwell's dust. Amen. Ballad of Douglas Bridge by Francis Carlin On Douglas Bridge I met a man who lived adjacent to Straban, before the English hung him high for riding with O'Hanlon. 
The eyes of him were just as fresh as when they burned within the flesh, and his bootlegs widely walked apart from riding with O'Hanlon. God save you, sir, I said with fear. You seem to be a stranger here. Not I, said he, nor any man who rides with Count O'Hanlon. I know each glen from North Tyrone to Monaghan, and I've been known by every clan and parish since I rode with Count O'Hanlon. Before that time, said he with pride, my father's road where now they ride as rapparees before the time of trouble and O'Hanlon. Good night to you, and God be with the tellers of the tale and myth, for they are of the spirit stuff that rides with Count O'Hanlon. Good night to you, said I, and God be with the chargers fairy shod that bear the Ulster's heroes forth to ride with Count O'Hanlon. On Douglas Bridge we parted, but the gap of dreams is never shut to one who saddled soul tonight rides out with Count O'Hanlon. The Indian Burying Ground by Philip Freneau In spite of all the learned have said, I still my old opinion keep. The posture that we give the dead points out the soul's eternal sleep. Not so the ancients of these lands. The Indian, when from life released, again is seated with his friends and shares again the joyous feast. His imaged birds and painted bowl and venison for a journey dressed bespeak the nature of the soul, activity that wants no rest. His bow for action ready bent and arrows with a head of stone can only mean that life is spent and not the old ideas gone. Thou stranger that shalt come this way, no fraud upon the dead commit. Observe the swelling turf and say they do not lie, but here they sit. Here still a lofty rock remains on which the curious eye may trace now wasted half by wearing rains, the fancies of a ruder race. Here still an aged elm aspires beneath whose far projecting shade, and which the shepherd still admires, the children of the forest played. There oft a restless Indian queen, pale Sheba with her braided hair, and many a barbarous form is seen to chide the man that lingers there. By midnight moons or misting dews, in habit of the chase arrayed, the hunter still the deer pursues, the hunter and the deer, a shade. And long shall timorous fancy see the painted sheaf and pointed spear. The reason self shall bow the knee to shadows and delusions here. End of section six. Recorded for LibriVox by Matt Benzing of Oxford, Ohio. Section 7 of The Haunted Hour, an anthology by Margaret Widmer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. Rank on rank of ghostly soldiers. The Song of Soldiers by Walter de la Mer. As I sat musing by the frozen dike, there was one man marching with a bright steel pike, marching in the daylight, like a ghost came he, and behind me was the moaning and the murmur of the sea. As I sat musing, twas not one but ten, rank on rank of ghostly soldiers marching o'er the fen. Marching in the misty air they showed in dreams to me, and behind me was the shouting and the shattering of the sea. As I sat musing, twas a host in dark array, with their horses and their cannon wheeling onward to the fray, moving like a shadow to the fate the brave must dree and behind me were the drums ring the trumpets of the sea. By the Blockhouse on the Hill by Helen Gray Cone A Ballad of Ninety-Eight The soul of the fair young man sprang up from the earth where his body lay, and he was aware of a grim dark soul companioning his way. 
who are you brother the fair soul said we wing together still and the soul replied that was swart and red the spirit of him who shot you dead by the blockhouse on the hill your men and you on the crest were first and the last foe left was i and the crackle of rifles i dropped and cursed lightning struck as the cheer outburst and the hot charge panted nigh you saw me writhe at the side of the trench you bade i know not what with one last gnash with one last wrench i sped my last sure shot the thing that lies on the sodden ground like a rack of the whirlwind's track your men have made of the body of me but they could not call you back in that black game i won i won but had you worked your will speak now the shame that you would have done in the blockhouse under the hill god judge my men said the fair young soul he knows you tried them sore had he given me power to bide an hour i had wrought that they forbore i bade them ere your bullet brought this swift this sweet release to bear your body out of the fire that you might rest in peace said the grim dark soul farewell 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 twixt you and me till they set red judas free from hell to kneel at the lord christ's knee not so not so said the fair young soul but reach me out your hand we too will kneel at the lord christ's knee and he that was hanged on the cruel tree will remember and understand we too will pray at the lord christ's knee that never on earth again the breath of the hot brute gun shall cloud the sight and the eyes of men the clean stars came into the sky the perfect night was still yet rose to heaven the old blood cry from the blockhouse under the hill night at gettysburg by don c sights by day golgotha sleeps but when night comes the army rallies to the beating drums columns are formed and banners wave or armies summoned from the grave the wheat field waves with reddened grain and the wounded wail and writhe in pain the hard-held bloody angel drips anew and picket charges with a ghostly crew while where the road to the village turns stands the tall shadow of old john burns the riders by catherine tynan reams is down in fire and smoke the hour of god is at the stroke round and round the ruined place jesus mary give us grace there are two riders clad in mail silver as the moon is pale one is tall as a knight's spear the younger one is lowlier small and slim and like a maid steeds and riders cast no shade who are then these cavaliers there was a sound as heaven dropped tears who are those who ride so light soundless in the flaming light where reims burns that was given by france to mary queen of heaven o oh, our reims our reims is down not is left of her renown hist what sound is in the breeze like the sighing of forest trees or the great wind or an army or the waves of the wild sea the tall knight rides fierce and fast to the sound of trumpet blast the little knight in fire and flame slender and soft as a dame rides and is not far behind his long hair floats on the wind and ever the tramp of chivalry comes like the sound of the sea this is michael rides abroad prince of the army of god and this like a lily arrayed is joan the blessed maid reams is down in fire and smoke and the hour of gods at the stroke the white comrade by robert haven schaufler under our curtain of fire over the clotted clods 
we charge to be withered to reel and despairingly wheel when the signal bade us retire from the terrible odds as we ebbed with the battle tide fingers of red-hot steel suddenly closed on my side i fell and began to pray i crawled on my hands and lay where a shallow crater yawned wide then i swooned when i woke it was yet day fierce was the pain of my wound but i saw it was death to stir for fifty paces away their trenches were in torture i prayed for the dark and the stealthy step of my friend who staunch to the very end would creep to the danger zone and offer his life as a mark to save my own night fell i heard his tread not stealthy but firm and serene as if my comrade's head were lifted far from that scene of passion and pain and dread as if my comrade's heart in carnage took no part as if my comrade's feet were set on some radiant street such as no darkness might haunt as if my comrade's eyes no deluge of flame could surprise no death and destruction daunt no red-beaked bird dismay nor sight of decay then in the bursting shell's dim light i saw he was clad in white for a moment i thought that i saw the smock of a shepherd in search of his flock alert were the enemy too and their bullets flew straight at a mark no bullet could fail for the seeker was tall and his robe was bright but he did not flee nor quail instead with unhurrying stride he came and gathering my tall frame like a child in his arms again i slept and awoke from a blissful dream in a cave by a stream my silent comrade had bound my side no pain now was mine but a wish that i spoke a mastering wish to serve this man who had ventured through hell my doom to revoke as only the truest of comrades can i begged him to tell me how best i might aid him and urgently prayed him never to leave me whatever betide when i saw he was hurt shot through the hands that were clasped in prayer then as the dark drops gathered there and fell in the dirt the wounds of my friend seemed to me such as no man might bear those bullet holes in the patient hands seemed to transcend all horrors that ever these war-drenched lands had known or would know till the mad world's end and suddenly i was aware that his feet had been wounded too and dimming the white of his side a dull stain grew you are hurt white comrade i cried his words i already foreknew these are old wounds said he but of late they have troubled me ghost of the argon by grant Lint rice you can hear them at night when the moon is hidden they sound like the rustle of winter leaves or lone lost winds that arise unbidden a rain that drips from the forest eaves as they glide again from their silent crosses to meet and talk of their final fight where over the group some stark tree tosses its eerie shadow across the night if you'll take some night with its moonless weather i know you will reason beyond a doubt that the rain and the wind and the leaves together are making the sounds you will hear about the wintry rustle of dead leaves falling the whispering wind through the matted glen but i can swear it's a sergeant calling the ghostly roll of his squad again they talk of war and its crimson glory and laugh at the trick which fate has played and over and over they tell the story of their final charge through the argon blade but gathering in by hill and hollow with a ghostly tramp on the rain-soaked loam there is one set rule which the clan must follow they never speak of returning home they whisper still of the rifle's clatter the riveting racket machine guns gave until dawn comes and the clan must scatter as each one glides to his waiting grave but here at the end of their last endeavor however their stark dreams leap the foam there is one set rule they will keep forever death 
to the phantom who speaks of home november eleventh by ruth comfort mitchell it was three slim young wraiths that met in the heart of a great playground and two of them watched the shining sports in the fields that ringed them round but one of them bent an earthward ear to follow a far-off sound listen he cried they know down there oh don't you hear the bells not i said one with a wise young smile i used to hear the shells not now oh not for ages now i came from the dardanelles i from the marne the third one sighed but these are only names ah bien mon vu one must forget those little strifes and fames here is a host of golden lads that play at golden games but the new boy ran to the turf's green rim and bent with an anxious frown it's the curfew bell i hear them cheer it's my little own home town i hear my dad i can almost see and his eager gaze plunged down soon mon ami soothed the dark-eyed wraith these teasing dreams will cease one plays all day one leaps the stars one seeks the golden fleece still the new boy turned his white young face from the land of the great release but i was killed two hours ago while they signed the terms of peace End of section 7section eight of the haunted hour an anthology by margaret wiedemer this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nemo sea ghost part one the flying dutchman by charles godfrey leland we met the flying dutchman by midnight he came his hull was all of hell-fire his sails were all aflame fire on the main-top fire on the bow fire on the gun-deck fire down below four and twenty dead men those were the crew the devil on the bowsprit fiddled as she flew we gave her the broadside right in the dip just like a candle went out the ship the phantom ship by henry wadsworth longfellow in mather's magnalia christi of the old colonial time may be found in prose the legend that is here set down in rhyme a ship sailed from new haven and the keen and the frosty airs that filled her sails at parting were heavy with good men's prayers o oh lord if it be thy pleasure thus prayed the old divine to bury our friends in the ocean take them for they are thine but master lamberton muttered and under his breath said he this ship is so crank and walty i fear our grave she will be and the ships that came from england when the winter months were gone brought no tidings of this vessel nor of master lamberton this put the people to praying that the lord would let them hear what in his greater wisdom he had done with their friends so dear and at last their prayers were answered it was in the month of june an hour before the sunset of a windy afternoon when steadily steering landward a ship was seen below and they knew it was lamberton master who sailed so long ago on she came with a cloud of canvas right against the wind that blew until the eye could distinguish the faces of the crew then fell her straining topmast hanging tangled in the shrouds and her sails were loosened and lifted and blown away like clouds and the mast with all their rigging fell slowly one by one and the hulk dilated and vanished as a sea mist in the sun and the people who saw this marvel 
each said unto his friend that this was the mould of the vessel and thus her tragic end and the pastor of the village gave thanks to god in prayer that to quiet their troubled spirits he had sent the ship of air the phantom light of the bay de chaleur by arthur wentworth hamilton eaton tis the laughter of pines that swing and sway where the breeze from the land meets the breeze from the bay tis the silvery foam of the silver tide and ripples that reach to the forest side tis the fisherman's boat in the track of sheen plying through tangled seaweed green o'er the bay de chaleur who has not heard of the phantom light that over the moaning waves at night dances and drifts in endless play close to the shore then far away fierce as the flame in sunset skies cold as the winter light that lies on the bay de chaleur they tell us that many a year ago from lands where the palm and olive grow where vines with the purple clusters creep over the hillsides gray and steep a knight in his doublet slashed with gold famed in that chivalrous time of old for valorous deeds and courage rare sailed with a princess wondrous fair to the bay de chaleur that a pirate crew from some isle of the sea a murderous band as e'er could be with a shadowy sail on a flag of night that flaunted and flew in heaven's sight swept in the wake of the lovers there and sank the ship and its freight so fair in the bay de chaleur strange is the tale that the fishermen tell they say that a ball of fire fell straight from the sky with crash and roar lighting the bay from shore to shore that the ship with a shudder and a groan sank through the waves to the caverns lone of the bay de chaleur that was the last of the pirate crew but many a night a black flag flew from the mast of a spectre vessel sailed by a spectre band that wept and wailed for the wreck they had wrought on the sea and the land for the innocent blood they had spilt on the sand of the bay de chaleur this is the tale of the phantom light that fills the mariner's heart at night with dread as it gleams o'er his path on the bay now by the shore then far away fierce as the flame in sunset skies cold as the winter moon that lies on the bay de chaleur the sands of d by charles kingsley o oh, mary go and call the cattle home and call the cattle home and call the cattle home across the sands of d the western wind was wild and dank with foam and all alone went she the western tide crept up along the sand and o'er and o'er the sand and round and round the sand as far as i could see the rolling mist came down and hid the land and never home came she oh is it weed or fish or floating hair a tress of golden hair a drowned maiden's hair above the nets at sea was never salmon yet that shone so fair among the stakes of d they rowed her in across the rolling foam the cruel crawling foam the cruel hungry foam to her grave beside the sea but still the boatmen hear her call the cattle home across the sands of d the lake of the dismal swamp by thomas moore they made her a grave too cold and damp for a soul so warm and true and she's gone to the lake of the dismal swamp where all night long by a firefly lamp she paddles her white canoe and her firefly lamp i soon shall see and her paddle i soon shall hear long and loving our life shall be and i'll hide the maid in a cypress tree when the footstep of death is near away to the dismal swamp he speeds his path was rugged and sore through tangled juniper beds of reeds 
through many a fen where the serpent feeds and man never trod before and when on the earth he sunk to sleep if slumber his eyelids knew he lay where the deadly vine doth weep its venomous tear and nightly steep the flesh with blistering dew and near him the she-wolf stirred the brake and the copper snake breathed in his ear till he starting cried from his dream awake oh when shall i see the dusky lake and the white canoe of my dear he saw the lake in a meteor bright quick over its surface played welcome he said my dear one's light and the dim shore echoed for many a night the name of the death-cold maid he hollowed a boat of the birchen bark which carried him off from shore far he followed the meteor spark wind was high and the clouds were dark and the boat returned no more but oft from the indian hunter's camp this lover and maid so true are seen at the hour of midnight damp to cross the lake by a firefly lamp and paddle their white canoe End of section 8「Section 9 of The Haunted Hour, an anthology by Margaret Widmer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gloria Begeman, Somerville, South Carolina. Sea Ghosts, Part 2 the Flying Dutchman of the Tappan Zee, Arthur Guterman. On Tappan Zee, a shroud of gray is heavy, dank, and low, and dimly gleams the beacon ray of white Pocantico. No skipper braves old Hudson now, where Nyack's headlands frown, and safely moored is every prow of drowsy Terrytown. Yet clear as word of human lip the river sends its shores the rhythmic rowlock clank and drip of even rolling oars what rower plies a reckless oar with mist on flood and strand that oarsman toils forevermore and ne'er shall reach the land roistering rollicking ram van dam fond of a frolic and fond of a dram fonder yea fonder proclaims renown of trancha bogardus of tarrytown leaves spiten devil to roar his song pull for the current is sly and strong nestles the robin and flies the bat hoy for the frolic at kakiat marry the sport at the quilting bee held at the farm on the tappan zee jovial labor with quips and flings dances with wonderful pigeon wings twitter of maidens and clack of dames honest flirtations and rousing games platters of savory beef and brawn buckets of treacle and good sapon oceans of cider and beer in lakes mountains of crullers and honey cakes such entertainment could never pall rambout van dam took his fill of all laughed with the wittiest worked with the zest danced with the prettiest drank with the best oh that enjoyment should breed annoy trancha grew fickle or cold or coy rambout possessed a jealous sprite scowled like the sky on a stormy night snarled a good-bye from his sullen throat blustered away to his tugging boat after him hastened jacoba's horn stay with us rambout till monday morn soon in the east will the dawn be gray rest from thy oars on the sabbath day angrily rambout van dam ripped back dunder and blitzen de shabajack preach to thy children and let them know spite of the devil and thee 
i'll row thousands of sundays if need there be home o'er this ewigvervlectikazee muttering curses he headed south jacob astounded with open mouth watched him receding when crash on crash volleyed the thunder a hissing flash smate on the river he looked again rambout was gone from the sight of men old dunderberg with grumbling roar hath warned the fog to flee but still that never wearied oar is heard on tappan zee a moon is closed on hudson's breast and lanterns gem the town the phantom craft that may not rest plies ever up and down neath skies of blue and skies of gray in spite of wind or tide until the trump of judgment day a sound and not beside sea ghosts part two the white ships and the red joyce b kilmer with drooping sail and pennant that never a wind may reach they float in sunless waters beside a sunless beach their misty masts and funnels are white as driven snow and with a pallid radiance their ghostly bulwarks glow here is a spanish galleon that once with gold was gay here is a roman trirame whose hues outshone the day but tynan dyes have faded and prows that once were bright with rainbow stains wear only death's livid dreadful white white as the ice that clove her that unforgotten day among her pallid sisters the grim titanic lay and through the leagues above her she looked aghast and said what is this living ship that comes where every ship is dead the ghostly vessels trembled from ruined stern to prow what was this thing of terror that broke their vigil now down through the startled ocean a mighty vessel came not white as all dead ships must be but red like living flame the pale green waves above her were swiftly strangely dyed by the great scarlet stream that flowed from out her wounded side and all her decks were scarlet and all her shattered crew she sank among the white ghost ships and stained them through and through the grim titanic greeted her and who art thou she said why dost thou join our ghostly fleet arrayed in living red we are the ships of sorrow who spend the weary night until the dawn of judgment day obscure and still and white nay said the scarlet visitor though i sink through die sea a ruined thing that was a ship i sink not as did ye for ye met with your destiny by storm or rock or fight so through the lagging centuries ye wear your robes of white but never crashing iceberg nor honest shot of foe nor hidden reef has sent me the way that i must go my wounds that stain the waters my blood that is like flame bear witness to a loathly deed a deed without a name i went not forth to battle i carried friendly men the children played about my deck the women sang and then and then the sun blushed scarlet and heaven hid its face the world that god created became a shameful place my wrongs cry out for vengeance the blow that sent me here was aimed in hell my dying scream has reached jehovah's ear not all the seven oceans shall wash away that stain upon the brow that wears a crown i am the brand of cain when god's great voice assembles the fleet on judgment day the ghosts of ruined ships will rise in sea and strait and bay though they have lain for ages beneath the changeless flood they all be white as silver but one 
shall be like blood. Sea Ghosts, Part Two Featherstone's Doom Robert Stephen Hawker Twist thou and twine in light and gloom, a spell is on thy hand. The wind shall be thy changeful loom, thy web the twisting sand. Twine from this hour in ceaseless toll on black rock's sullen shore, till cordage of the sand shall coil where crested surges roar. Tis for that hour when from the wave near voices wildly cried, when thy stern had no succor gave the cable at thy side. Twist thou and twine in light and gloom, the spell is on thine hand, the wind shall be thy changeful loom, thy web the shifting sand. Sea Ghosts, Part Two Sea Ghosts, May Byron O oh, stormy nights, be they summer or winter, hurricane nights like these, when spar and topsail are rag and splinter, hurled o'er the sluicing seas, to the jagged edge where the cliffs lean over, climb as you best may climb, lie there and listen where mysteries hover, haunting the tides of time. The crumbling surf on the shingle rattles, the great waves topple and pour, full of the fury of ancient battles, claimant with cries of war. The gale has summoned, the night has beckoned, lo, from the east and west, stately shadows arise unrectoned out of their deeps of rest. Wild on the wind are voices ringing, echoes that throng the air, valiant voices of victory singing, or dark with sublime despair. To the distant drums with their rumbling hollow, the answering trumpets blow, war horn and fife and cymbals follow from galleys of long ago. The crested breaker on reef and boulder that swirls in cavernous black carries a challenge from decks that moulder to ships that never came back. The gale that swoops and the sea that wrestles are one in their wrath and might, with the crash and clashing of armed vessels grinding across the night. Out of the dark the broadsides thunder, clattering to and fro, the old sea fighters, the old world's wonder, are manning their wrecks below. You shall smell the smoke, you shall hear the crackle, shall mark on the surly blast rush and tear of the rending tackle thud of the falling mast with the foam that flies and the spray that spatters scourging the strand again a terrible outcry leaps and shatters tumult of drowning men the steep gray cliff is alive and trembles was never such fear as this a fleet a fleet at its foot assembles out of the sea's abyss it quakes and quivers its grassy verges vibrant with uttermost dread it knows the groan of the laden sweets the shout of the deathless dead in a rolling march of reverberations marching with wind and tide heroes of unremembered nations vaunt their immortal pride Britain, Spaniard, Phoenician, Roman, gallant, implacable hosts, locked in fight with phantom foemen, gather the grim sea ghosts. Sea Ghosts, Part Two Fog Wraiths, Mildred Howells. In from the ocean the white fog creeps, blotting out ship and rock and tree while wrapped in its shroud from the soundless deeps back to the land come the lost at sea over the weeping grass they drift by well-known paths to their home again to finger the latch they may not lift and peer through the glistening window-pane 
then in the churchyard each seeks the stone to its memory raised among the rest and they watch by their empty graves alone till the fog rolls back to the ocean's breast end of section nine section ten of the haunted hour an anthology by margaret widmer this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by gloria begeman somerville south carolina cheerful spirits part one cape horn gospel john macefield i was in a hooker once said carlson and bill as was a seaman died so we lashed him in an old tarpaulin and tumbled him across the side and the fun of it was that all his gear was divided up among the crew before that blushing human error our crawling little captain knew on the passage home one morning as certain as i praise for grace there was old bill's shatter a haulin at the mizzen weather topsail brace he was all grown green with seaweed he was all lashed up and shored so i says to him i says why billy what's a bringin of you back aboard i'm a weary of them there mermaids says old bill's ghost to me it ain't no place for a christian below there under sea for it's all blown sand and shipwrecks and old bones eaten bare and them cold fishy females with long green weeds for hair and there ain't no dances shuffled and no old yarns is spun and there ain't no stars but starfish and never any moon or sun i heard your keel a-passing and the running rattle of the brace and i says stand by says william for a shift towards a better place well he saugered about decks till sunrise when a rooster in the hen-coop crowed and as so much smoke he faded and as so much smoke he goed and i've often wondered since jan how his old ghost stands to fare long of them cold fishy females with long green weeds for hair legend of hamilton tie richard harris barham the captain is walking his quarter-deck with a troubled brow and a bended neck one eye is down through the hatchway cast the other turns up to the truck on the mast yet none of the crew may venture to hint our skipper hath gotten a sinister squint the captain again the letter hath read which the bumboat woman brought out to spithead still since the good ship sailed away he reads that letter three times a day yet the writing is broad and fair to see as a skipper may read in his degree and the seal is as black and as broad and as flat as his own cockade in his own cocked hat he reads and he says as he walks to and fro curse the old woman she bothers me so he pauses now for the topmen halt on the larboard quarter a sail a sail that grim old captain he turns him quick and bawls through his trumpet for hairy-faced dick the breeze is blowing huzzé huzzé the breeze is blowing away away the breeze is blowing a race a race the breeze is blowing we near the chase blood will flow and bullets will fly oh where will be then young hamilton tie on the foeman's deck where a man should be with his sword in his hand and his foe at his knee coxswain or boatswain or reefer may try but the first man on board will be hamilton tie hairy-faced dick hath a swarthy hue between a gingerbread nut 
and a jew and his pigtail is long and bushy and thick like a pump handle stuck on the end of a stick hairy faced dick understands his trade he stand by the breech of a long carronade the linstock glows in his bony hand waiting that grim old skipper's command the bullets are flying huzza huzza the bullets are flying away away the brawny boarders mount by the chains and are over their buckles in blood and in brains on the foeman's deck where a man should be young hamilton tye waves his cutlass high and captain crapaud bends low at his knee hairy-faced dick linstock in hand is waiting that grim-looking skipper's command a wink comes sly from that sinister eye hairy-faced dick at once lets fly and knocks off the head of young hamilton tye there's a lady sits lonely in bower and hall her pages and handmaidens come at her call now look ye my handmaidens haste now and see how he sits there and glowers with his head on his knee the maidens smile and her thought to destroy they bring her a little pale mealy-faced boy and the mealy-faced boy says mother dear now hamilton's dead i've ten thousand a year the lady has donned her mantle and hood she is bound for shrift at st mary's rood oh the taper shall burn and the bell shall toll and the mass shall be said for my stepson's soul and the tablet fair shall be hung on high o rata pro anima hamilton tie her coach and four draws up to the door with her groom and her footman and a half score more the lady steps into her coach alone and they hear her sigh and they hear her groan they close the door and they turn the pin but there's one rides with her that never stepped in all the way there and all the way back the harness strains and the coach springs crack the horses snort and plunge and kick till the coachman thinks he is driving old nick and the grooms and the footmen wonder and say what makes the old coach so heavy to-day but the mealy-faced boy peeps in and sees a man sitting there with his head on his knees tis ever the same in hall or in bower wherever the place whatever the hour that lady mutters and talks to the air and her eye is fixed on an empty chair but the mealy-faced boy still whispers with dread she talks to a man with never a head there's an old yellow admiral living at bath as gray as a badger as thin as a lath and his very queer eyes have such very queer leers they seem to be trying to peep at his ears that old yellow admiral goes to the rooms and he plays long whist but he frets and he fumes for all his knaves stand upside down and the jack of club does nothing but frown and the kings and the aces and all the best trumps get into the hands of the other old frumps while close to his partner a man he sees counting the tricks with his head on his knees in radcliffe highway there's an old marine store and a great black doll bangs out of the door there are rusty locks and dusty bags and musty files and fusty rags and a lusty old woman called thirsty nan and her crusty old husband's a hairy-faced man that hairy-faced man is sallow and wan and his great thick pigtail is withered and gone and he cries take away that lubberly chap that sits there and grins with his head in his lap and the neighbors say as they see him look sick 
what a rum old covey is hairy faced dick that admiral lady and hairy faced man may say what they please and may do what they can but one thing seems remarkably clear they may die to-morrow or live till next year but wherever they live or whenever they die they'll never get quit of young hamilton tie the supper superstition thomas hood a pathetic ballad o oh, flesh flesh how art thou fishified mercutio twas twelve o'clock by the chelsea chimes when all in a hungry trim good mr jupp sat down to sup with his wife and kate and jim said he upon this dainty cod how bravely i shall sup when whiter than the tablecloth a ghost came rising up o oh, father dear o oh, mother dear dear kate and brother jim you know when some one went to sea don't cry but i am him you hope some day with fond embrace to greet your lonesome jack but oh i am come here to say i'm never coming back from alexandria we set sail with corn and oil and tigs but steering too much sow we struck upon the sow and pigs the ship we pumped till we could see old england from the tops when down she went with all our hands right in the channel's chops just give a look in norrie's chart the very place it tells i think it says twelve fathom deep clay bottom mixed with shells well there we are till hands aloft we have at last a call the pug i had for brother jim kate's parrot too and all but oh my spirit cannot rest in davy jones sod till i've appeared to you and said don't sup on that there cod you live on land and little think what passes in the sea last sunday week at two p m that cod was picking row those oysters too that look so plump and seem so nicely done they put my corpse in many shells instead of only one oh do not eat those oysters then and do not touch the shrimps when i was in my briny grave they sucked my blood like imps don't eat what brutes would never eat the brutes i used to pat they'll know the smell they used to smell just try the dog and cat the spirit fled they wept his fate and cried alas alack at last up started brother jim let's try if jack was jack they called the dog they called the cat the little kitten too and down they put the cod and sauce to see what brutes would do old tray licked all the oysters up puss never stood at climps but munched the cod and little kit quite feasted on the shrimps the thing was odd and minus cod and sauce they stood like posts o oh, prudent folks for fear of hoax put no belief in ghosts end of section ten section eleven of the haunted hour an anthology by margaret Whittemer. this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by april six zero nine zero california united states of america cheerful spirits part two the ingoldsby penance by richard harris barnum the ingoldsby penance by richard harris barnum a legend of palestine in west kent out and spake sir ingoldsby bray a stalwart knight i ween was he come east come west come lance and rest 
confalchion in hand i'll tickle the best of the soldan's chivalry oh they came west and they came east twenty-four ymers and sheiks at the least and they hammered away at sir ingoldsby bray fall back fall edge cut thrust and point but he'd topped off head and he'd lopped off joint twenty and three of high degree lay stark and stiff on the crimsoned lea all all save one and he ran up a tree now count them my squire now count them and see twenty and three twenty and three all of them nobles of high degree there they be lying on ascalon lea out and spake sir ingoldsby bray what news what news come tell to me what news what news thou little foot page i've been whacking the foe till it seems an age sign i was in ingoldsby hall so free what news what news from ingoldsby hall come tell me now thou page so small o hawk and hound are safe and sound beast and byre and steed and stall and the watch-dogs bark and soon as it's dark bays wakeful guard around ingoldsby hall i care not a pound for hawk or for hound for steed and stall or for watch-dogs bay fain would i hear of my dainty dear how fares dame alice my lady gay sir ingoldsby bray he said in his rage what news what news thou naughty foot page the little foot page full low crouched he and he doffed his cap and he bended his knee now lith and listen sir bray to me lady alice sits lonely in bower and hall her sighs they rise and her tears they fall she sits alone and she makes her moan dance and song she considers quite wrong feast and revel mere sneers of the devil she mendeth her hose and she crieth alack when will sir ingoldsby bray come back thou liest thou liest thou naughty foot page full loud doth thou lie false page to me there in thy breast neath thy silken vest what scroll is that false page i see sir ingoldsby bray in his rage drew near that little foot page he blanched with fear now where may the prior of abigdon lie king richard's confessor i ween is he and tidings rare to him do i bear and news of price from his rich abbey nay nay now nay thou naughty page no learned clerk i trow i am i but well i ween may there be seen dame malice's hand with half an eye now nay now nay thou naughty page from abingdon abbey comes not thy news although no clerk well may i mark the particular turn of her p's and q's sir ingoldsby bray in his fury and rage by the back of the neck takes that little foot page the scroll he seizes the page he squeezes and buffets and pinches his nose till he sneezes then he cuts with his dagger the silken threads which they used in those days stead of little queen's heads when the contents of the scroll met his view sir ingoldsby bray in a passion grew backward he drew his mailed shoe and he kicked that naughty foot page that he flew like a cloth yard shaft from a bended yew i may not say whither i never knew now count the slain upon ascalon plain go count them my squire go count them again twenty and three there they be stiff and stark on that crimsoned lee twenty and three stay let me see stretch in his gore there lieth one more by the pope's triple crown there are twenty and four twenty-four trunks i ween are there but their heads and their limbs are nobody knows where ay twenty-four corpses i've read there be though one got away and ran up a tree look nigher look nigher my trusty squire one is the course of a barefooted friar out and spake sir ingoldsby bray a boon a boon king richard quoth he now heaven thee save a boon i crave a boon sir king on my bended knee a year and a day have i been away king richard from ingoldsby hall so free dame alice she sits there in, a, in lonely guise and she makes her moan and she sobs and, and she sighs and tears like raindrops fall from her eyes and she darneth her hose and she crieth alack oh when will sir ingoldsby bray come back a boon a boon my liege quoth he fair ingoldsby hall i fain would see rise up rise up sir ingoldsby bray king richard said right graciously of all in my host that i love the most i love none better sir bray than thee 
Rise up, rise up, thou hast my boon. But mind you make haste and come back again soon. Fight two. Pope Gregory sits in St. Peter's chair. Pontiff proud, I ween, is he. And a belted knight in armor dight is begging a boon on his bended knee. With sighs of grief and sounds of woe, featly he kisseth his holiness's toe. Now pardon, holy father, I crave. O holy father, pardon and grace. In my fury and rage, a little footpage I have left. I fear me in evil case. A scroll of shame from a faithless dame. Did that naughty footpage to a pair more bare? I gave him a lick with a stick and a kick that sent him, I can't tell you, your holiness, where? Had he as many necks as hairs, he had broken them all down those perilous stairs. Rise up, rise up, Sir Goldsby Bray. Rise up, rise up, I say to thee. A soldier, I trow, of the cross art thou. Rise up, rise up, from thy bended knee. Ill it seems that soldier true, of holy church, should vainly sue. Foot pages they are by no means rare. A thriftless crew, I ween, be they. Well, mote we spare a page or a pair, for the matter of that, Sir Ingoldsby Bray. But stout and true, soldiers like you, grow scarcer and scarcer every day. Be prayers for the dead duly read, let a mass be sung, and a pater be said. So may your qualms of conscience cease, and the little footpage shall rest in peace. Now pardon, holy father, I crave. O holy father, pardon and grace. Dame Alice, my wife, the bane of my life, I have left, I fear me, in evil case. A scroll of shame in my rage I tore, which the caitiff page to a paramour bore. Twere bootless to tell how I stormed and swore. Alack and alack, too surely I knew. The turn of each pea and the tail of each cue. And away to Ingoldsby Hall I flew. Dame Alice I found, she sank on the ground. I twisted her neck till I twisted it round. With jibe and jeer and mock and scoff, I twisted it on till I twisted it off. All the king's doctors and all the king's men's can't put fair Alice's head on again. Well a day, well a day, Sir Ingoldsby Bray, why really, I hardly know what to say. Foul sin, I trow, a fair lady to slay, because she perhaps been a little too gay. Monk must shaunt and none must pray, for each mass they sing and each prayer they say. For a year and a day, Sir Ingoldsby Bray, a fair rose noble must duly pay. So may his qualms of conscience cease, and the soul of Dame Alice may rest in peace. Now pardon, Holy Father, I crave, O Holy Father, pardon and grace. No power could save that paramour knave. I left him, I wot, in evil case. There midst the slain upon Ascalon plain, unburied, I trow, doth his body remain. His legs lie here, and his arms lie there, and his head lies, I can't tell your holiness where. Now out and alas, Sir in golds be bray. Foul sin it were, thou doughty knight, to hack and to hew a champion true, of holy church in such pitiful plight. Foul sin her warriors so to slay, when they're scarcer and scarcer every day. A chantry fair, and of monks a pair, to pray for his soul for ever and I. Thou must duly endow, Sir Ingoldsby Bray, and fourteen marks by the year thou must pay, for plenty of lights to burn their o nights. None of your rascally dips, but sound, round, ten penny moulds of four to the pound, and a shirt of the roughest and coarsest hair for a year and a day, Sir Ingolds beware. So may your qualms of conscience cease, and the soul of the soldier shall rest in peace. Now nay, holy father, now nay, now nay, less penance may serve, quoth Sir Ingolds be bray. No champion free of the cross was he, no belted baron of high degree. No knight nor squire did there expire. He was, I trow, a barefooted friar, and the abbot of Abingdon long may wait, with his monks around him, and early and late, may look from loophole and turret and gate. He hath lost his prior, his prior his pate. Now thunder and turf, Pope Gregory said, and his hair raised his triple crown right off his head. Now thunder and turf, and out and alas, a horrible thing has come to pass. What? Cut off the head of the reverend prior? and say he was only a barefooted friar? What baron or squire, or knight of the sire, is half so good as a holy friar? O terpissimi, virniquissimi, gliratissimi, quasim, isim, never, I trow, have the servis serverum had before him such a breach of decorum, such a gross violation of borum bonorum, 
and won't have again Sacula Seclorum. Come hither to me, my cardinals three, my bishops in partibus, masters in artibus. Hither to me, A, B, and D, D. Doctors and proctors of every degree. Go fetch me a book. Go fetch me a bell. As big as a dustman's and a candle as well. I'll send him where good manners won't let me tell. Pardon and grace, now pardon and grace. Sir Ingoldsby Bray fell flat on his face. Me a culpa in sooth, I'm in pitiful case. Pacave, Pacave, and I've done every wrong. But my heart is it is stout, and my arm it is strong. And I'll fight for holy church all day long. And the Ingoldsby lands are broad and fair. And they're here and they're there, I can't tell you where. And the holy church shall come in for her share. Pope Gregory paused, and he sat himself down, and he somewhat relaxed his terrible frown, and his cardinals three they picked up his crown. Now if it be so that your own you've been wrong, and your heart is so stout, and your arm is so strong, and you really will fight like a trump all day long. If the Ingoldsby lands do lie here and there, and holy church shall come in for her share. Why, my cardinals three, you'll agree with me, that it gives a new turn to the whole affair and I think that the penitent need not despair. If it be so, as you seem to say, rise up, rise up, Sir Ingoldsby Bray. In abbey so fair Sir Bray shall found, whose innermost walls encircling bound, shall take in a couple of acres of ground, and there in that abbey all the year round, a full choir of monks and a full choir of nuns, and Sir Ingoldsby Bray, without delay, shall hie him again to Ascalon Plain and gathered the bones of the foully slain, and shall place said bones with all possible care in an elegant shrine in his abbey so fair, and plenty of light shall there be on nights, none of your rascally dips but sound, best superfine wax wicks, for to the pound, and monk and nun shall pray, each one for the soul of the prior of Abingdon, and Sir Ingoldsby Bray, so bold and so brave, never shall wash himself, comb or shave, nor adorn his body, nor drink gin toddy, nor indulge in a pipe, but shall dine upon tripe, and blackberries gathered before they are ripe, and forever abhor, renounce, and abjure, rum, hollands, and brandy, wine, punch, and liqueur. Sir Ingoldsby Bray here gave way to a feeling which prompted a word profane, but he swallowed it down by an effort to gain, and his holiness luckily fancied his gulp a mere repetition of Omea culpa. Thrice three times on Candlemas Day, between Vespers and Crompling, Sir Ingoldsby Bray, and shall run round the abbey as best he may, subjecting his back to thump and to thwack, well and truly laid on by a barefooted friar, with a stout cat o' nine tails of whipcord and wire. And not he, nor his heir, shall take, use, or bear, any more from this day, the surname of Bray. As being dishonored, but all issue male, he has, shall with himself go henceforth by an alias so his qualms of conscience at length shall cease, and page Jamin Pryor shall rest in peace. Sir Ingoldsby, now no longer Bray, is off like a shot away and away, over the brine to far Palestine, to rummage and hunt over Ascalon Plain, for the unburied bones of his victim slain. Look out, my squire, look nigher and nigher, look out for the corpse of a barefooted friar, and pick up the arms and the legs of the dead, and pick up his body and pick up his head. Fight three. Ings Goldby Abbey is fair to see. It hath manners a dozen and royalties three. With right and free warren, whatever that be, rich pastures in front and green woods in the rear, all in full leaf at the right time of year. About Christmas or so, they fall into the sear, and the prospect, of course, becomes rather more drear. But it's really delightful in springtime and near. The great gate Father Thames rolls sun bright and clear. Cobham Woods to the right, on the opposite shore, land and hill in the distance, ten miles off or more. Then you've Milton and Gravesend behind and before. You can see almost all the way down to the Nore. So charming a spot, it's rarely one's lot to see, and when seen, it's as rarely forgot. Yes, in Goldsby Abbey is fair to see and its monks and its duns are fifty and three and there they all stand each in their degree drawn up in the front of their sacred abode two by two in their regular mode while a funeral comes down the rochester road palmers twelve from a foreign strand cockle and hat and staff in hand come marching in pairs a holy band 
little boys twelve dressed all in white each with his brass and censer bright and singing away with all his might follow the palmers a goodly sight next high in air twelve yeomen bear on their sturdy backs with a good deal of care a patent sarcophagus firmly reared of spanish mahogany not veneered and behind walks a knight with a very long beard close by his side is a friar supplied with a stout cat o nine tails of tough cowhide while all sorts of queer men bring up the rear men at arms nigger captives and bowmen and spearmen it boots not to tell what you'll guess very well how some sang the requiem some told the bell suffice it to say twas on candlemas day the procession i speak of reached the cecilium and in lieu of a supper the knight on his crupper received the first taste of the father's flagellium that as chronicles tell he continued to dwell all the rest of his days in the abbey he'd founded by the pious of both sexes ever surrounded and partaking the fare of the monks and the nuns ate the cabbage alone without touching the buns that year after year having run round the quad with his back as enjoined him exposed to the rod having not only kissed it but blessed it and thanked it he died as all thought in the odour of sanctity when strange to relate and you'll hardly believe what i'm going to tell you next candlemas eve the monks and the nuns in the dead of the night tumble all of them out of their bed in a fright alarmed by the balls and the calls and the squalls of some one who seemed running all round the walls looking out soon by the light of the moon there appears most distinctly to every one's view and making as seems to them all this ado the form of a knight with a beard like a jew as black as if steeped in that matchless of hunts and so bushy it would not disgrace mr Munts. a barefooted friar stands behind him and shakes a flagellum whose lashes appear to be snakes while more terrible still the astounded beholders perceive the friar has no head on his shoulders but is holding his pate in his left hand out straight as if by a closer inspection to find where to get the best cut at his victims behind with the aid of a small bull-eye lantern as placed by our own new police in a belt round his waist all gaze with surprise scarce believing their eyes when the knight makes a start like a racehorse and flies from his headless tormentor repeating his cries in vain for the friar to his skirts closely sticks running after him so said the abbot like bricks thrice three times did the phantom knight course round the abbey as best he might be thwacked and be smacked by the headless sprite while his shriek so piercing made all hearts thrill then a whoop and a hallo and all was still in goldsby abbey has passed away and at this time of day one can hardly survey any traces or tracks save a few ruins gray with age and fast mouldering into decay of the structure once built by sir ingoldsby bray but still there are many folks living who say that on every candlemas eve the knight accoutred and dight in his armor bright with his thick black beard and the clerical sprite with his head in his hand and his lantern alight run round the spot where the old abbey stood and are seen in the neighboring glee bland and wood more especially still if it's stormy and windy you may hear them for miles kicking up their wild shindy and that once in a gale of wind sleet and hail they frightened the horses and upset the mail what tis breaks the rest of those souls unblessed would now be a thing rather hard to be guessed though some say the squire on his deathbed confessed that on ascalon plain when the bones of the slain were collected that day and packed up in a chest caulked and made water tight by command of the knight though the legs and the arms they'd got all pretty right and the body itself in a decentish plight yet the friar's pericranium was nowhere in sight so to save themselves trouble they picked up instead and popped on the shoulders a saracen head thus the knight in the terms of his penance had failed and the pope's absolution of course not availed now though this might be it don't seem to agree with one thing which i own is a poser to me i mean as the miracle wrought at the shrine containing the bones brought from far palestine were so great and notorious tis hard to combine this fact with the reason these people assign or suppose that the head of the murder divine could be aught but what yankees would call genuine tis a very nice question but be it as it may the ghost of sir ingoldsby said yvonne bray 
it is boldly affirmed by the folks great and small about milton and chalk and round cobham hall still on candlemas day haunts the old ruined wall and that many have seen him and more heard him squall so i think when the facts of the case you recall my inference reader you'll fairly forestall viz that spite of the hope held out by the pope sir ingoldsby bray was d d after all moral foot pages and servants of every degree in livery or out of it listen to me see what comes of lying don't join in the league to humbug your master or aid in intrigue ladies married and single from this understand how foolish it is to send letters by hand don't stand for the sake of a penny but when you've a billet to send to a lover or friend put it into the post and don't cheat the revenue reverend gentlemen you are given to rome don't keep up a soft correspondence at home but while you're abroad lead respectable lives love your neighbors and welcome but don't love their wives and as bricklayers cry from the tiles and the leads when they're shoveling the snow off take care of your heads knights whose hearts are so stout and whose arms are so strong learn to twist a wife's neck is decidedly wrong if your servants offend you or give themselves airs rebuke them but mildly don't kick them downstairs to poor richard's homely old proverb attend if you want matters well managed go if not send a servant's too often a negligent elf if it's business of consequence do it yourself the state of society seldom requires people now to bring home with them unburied friars but they sometimes do bring home an inmate for life now don't do that by proxy but choose your own wife for think how annoying twould be when you're wed to find in your bed on the pillow instead of the sweet face you look for a saracen's head end of section eleven section twelve of the haunted hour an anthology by margaret widmer this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by april six zero nine zero california united states of america cheerful spirits part three pompey's ghost by thomas hood twas twelve o'clock not twelve at night but twelve o'clock at noon because the sun was shining bright and not the silver moon a proper time for friends to call or pots or penny post when lo as phoebe sat at work she saw her pompey's ghost now when a female has a call from people that are dead like paris ladies she receives her visitors in bed but pompey's spirit would not come like spirits that are white because he was a blackamoor and wouldn't show at night but of all unexpected things that happen to us here the most unpleasant is a rise in what is very dear so phoebe screamed an awful scream to prove the seaman's text that after black appearances white squalls will follow next oh phoebe dear oh phoebe dear don't go and scream or faint you think because i'm black i am the devil but i ain't behind the hills of lady lamb i walked while i had breath but that is past and i am now a walking after death no murder though i come to tell by base and bloody crime so phoebe dear put off your fits to some more fitting time no coroner like a boatswain's mate my body need attack with this round dozen to find out why i have died so black one sunday shortly after tea my skin began to burn as if i had in my inside a heater like a yearn delirious in the night i grew and as i lay in bed they say i gathered all the wool you see upon my head his lordship for his doctor sent my treatment to begin i wish that he had called him out before he called him in for though to be physic he was bred and passed at surgeon's hall to make his post a sinecure he never cured at all the doctor looked about my breast and then about my back and then he shook his head and said your case looks very black at first he sent me hot cayenne and then gamboge to swallow but still my fever would not turn to scarlet or to yellow with matter and with turmeric he made his next attack but neither he nor all his drugs could stop my dying black at last i got so sick of life and sick of being dosed one monday morning i gave up 
my physic and the ghost oh phoebe dear what pain it was to sever every tie you know black beetles feel as much as giants when they die and if there is a bridal bed or bride of, of little worth it's lying in a bed of mould along with mother earth alas some happy happy day in church i hoped to stand and like a muff of sable skin receive your lily hand but sternly with that piebald match my fate untimely clashes for now like pompey double i i'm sleeping in my ashes and now farewell a last farewell i'm wanted down below and have but time enough to add one word before i go in morning crepe and bombazine ne'er spend your precious pelf don't go in black for me for i can do it for myself henceforth within my grave i rest but death who there inherits allowed my spirit leave to come you seemed so near your spirits but do not sigh and do not cry by grief too much engrossed nor for a ghost of colour turn the colour of a ghost again farewell my phoebe dear once more a last adieu for i must make myself as scarce as swans of sable hue from black to grey from grey to naught the shape began to fade and like an egg though not so white the ghost was newly laid end of pompey's ghost poem cheerful spirits part three the ghost by thomas hood a very serious ballad in middle row some years ago there lived one mr brown and many folks considered him the stoutest man in town but brown and stout will both wear out one friday he died hard and left a widowed wife to mourn at twenty pence a yard now widow b in two short months thought mourning quite a tax and wished like mr wilberforce to manumit her blacks with mr street she soon was sweet the thing came thus about she asked him in at home and then at church he asked her out assurance such as this the man in ashes could not stand up so like a phoenix he rose up against the hand in hand one dreary night the angry sprite appeared before her view it came a little after one but she was after two oh mrs b oh mrs b are these your sorrow's deeds already getting up a flame to burn your widow's weeds it's not so long since i have left for i the mortal scene my memory like rogers is should still be bound in green yet if my face you still retrace i almost have a doubt i'm like an old forget-me-not with all the leaves torn out to think that on that finger joint another pledge should cling oh bess upon my very soul it struck like knock and ring a ton of marble on my breast can hinder my return your conduct ma'am has set my blood a boiling in its urn remember oh remember how the marriage rite did run if ever we one flesh should be tis now when i have none and you sir once a bosom friend of perjured faith convict as ghostly toe can give no blow consider yourself kicked a hollow voice is all i have but this i tell you plain mary come up you marry ma'am and i'll come up again more he said but chanticleer the sprightly shade did shock with sudden crow and off he went like fowling piece at cock end of section twelve section thirteen of the haunted hour an anthology by margaret Widmer. this is a librivox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Stefan Cheerful Spirits, Part 4 Mary's Ghost, by Thomas Hood A Pathetic Ballad Twas in the middle of the night, to sleep young William tried, when Mary's ghost came stealing in and stood at his bedside. O oh, William dear, O oh, William dear, my rest eternal ceases. Alas, my everlasting peace is broken into pieces. 
I thought the last of all my cares would end with my last minute. But though I went to my long home, I didn't stay long in it. The body snatchers, they have come and made a snatch at me. It's very hard, them kind of men won't let a body be. You thought that I was buried deep, quite decent-like and cherry, but from her grave in Mary Bone, they've come and boned your Mary. The arm that used to take your arm is took to Dr. Weiss, and both my legs are gone to walk the hospital at Guy's. I vowed that you should have my hand, but fate gives us denial. You'll find it there, at Dr. Bell's, in spirits and a file. As for my feet, the little feet you used to find so pretty, there's one I know in Bedford Row, the tothers in the city. I can't tell where my head is gone, but Dr. Carp you can. As for my trunk, it's all packed up to go by Pickford's van. I wish you'd go to Mr. P and save me such a ride. I don't half like the outside place they've took for my inside. The cock, it crows. I must be gone. My William, we must part. But I'll be yours in death. Although, Sir Astley has my heart. Don't go to weep upon my grave and think that there I be. They haven't left an atom there of my anatomy. The Superstitious Ghost by Arthur Gorderman I'm such a quiet little ghost, demure and inoffensive. The other spirits say I'm most absurdly apprehensive. Through all the merry hours of night, I'm uniformly cheerful. I love the dark, but in the light, I own I'm rather fearful. Each dawn I cower down in bed, and every brightness seen, that weird, uncanny form of dread, an awful human being. Of course I'm told they can't exist, that nature would not let them, but Willie Spook, the humanist, declares that he has met them. He says they do not glide like us, but walk in eerie paces. They're solid, not diaphanous, with arms and legs and faces. And some are beggars, some are kings, some have and some are wanting. They squander time in doing things, instead of simply haunting. They talk of art, the horrid crew, and things they call ambitions. Oh, yes, I know as well as you, they're only superstitions. But should the dreadful day arrive when, starting up, I see one, I'm sure twill scare me quite alive, and then, oh, then I'll be one. Dave Lilly by Joyce Kilmer There's a brook on the side of Greylock that used to be full of trout. But there's nothing there now but minnows. They say it is all fished out. I fished there many a summer day some twenty years ago. And I never quit without getting a mess of a dozen or so. There was a man, Dave Lilly, 
who lived on the North Adams Road, and he spent all his time fishing while his neighbors reaped and sowed. He was the luckiest fisherman in the Berkshire Hills, I think. And when he didn't go fishing, he'd sit in the tavern and drink. Well, Dave is dead and buried, and nobody cares very much. They have no use in Greylock for drunkards and loafers and such. But I always liked Dave Lilly. He was pleasant as you could wish. He was shiftless and good for nothing, but he certainly could fish. The other night, I was walking up the hill from Williamstown, and I came to the brook I mentioned, and I stopped on the bridge and sat down. I looked at the blackened water with its little flecks of white, and I heard it ripple and whisper in the still of the summer night. And after I'd been there a minute, it seemed to me I could feel the presence of someone near me, and I heard the hum of a reel. And the water was churned and broken, and something was brought to land by a twist and a flirt of a shadowy rod in a deft and shadowy hand. I scrambled down to the brookside and hunted all about. There wasn't a sign of a fisherman. There wasn't a sign of a trout. But I heard somebody chuckle behind the hollow oak, and I got a whiff of tobacco like Lily used to smoke. It's fifteen years, they tell me, since anyone fished that brook, and there's nothing in it but minnows that nibble the bait off your hook. But before the sun has risen, and after the moon has set, I know that it's full of ghostly trout for Lily's ghost to get. I guess I'll go to the tavern and get a bottle of rye, and leave it down by the hollow oak where Lily's ghost went by. I meant to go up on the hillside and try to find his grave and put some flowers on it. But this will be better for Dave. Martin by Joyce Kilmer When I am tired of earnest men, intense and keen and sharp and clever, pursuing fame with brush or pen, or counting metal discs forever, then from the halls of Shadowland, beyond the trackless purple sea, old Martin's ghost comes back to stand beside my desk and talk to me. Still, on his delicate pale face, a quizzical thin smile is showing. His cheeks are wrinkled like fine lace. His kind blue eyes are gay and glowing. He wears a brilliant-hued cravat, a suit to match his soft gray hair, a rakish stick, a knowing hat a manner blithe and debonair. How good that he who always knew that being lovely was a duty should have gold halls to wander through and should himself inhabit beauty. How like his old unselfish way to leave those halls of splendid mirth and comfort those condemned to stay upon the dull and somber earth. Some people ask, what cruel chance 
made Martin's life so sad a story. Martin? Why, he exhaled romance and wore an overcoat of glory, a fleck of sunlight in the street, a horse, a book, a girl who smiled. Such visions made each moment sweet for this receptive ancient child. Because it was old Martin's lot to be, not make, a decoration, shall we then scorn him, having not his genius of appreciation? Rich joy and love he got and gave, his heart was merry as his dress. Pile laurel reefs upon his grave, who did not gain, but was success. End of section 13、section、number 14 of The Haunted Hour, an anthology by Margaret Widemer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matt Penzing of Oxford, Ohio. Haunted Places, Part One. The Listeners, by Walter de la Mer. Is anybody there? said the traveler, knocking on the moonlit door, and his horse in the silence champed the grasses of the forest's ferny floor, and a bird flew up out of the turret above the traveler's head, and he smote upon the door again the second time. Is there anybody there? he said. But no one descended to the traveller, no head from the leafed fringed sill leaned over and looked into his grey eyes where he stood perplexed and still, but only the host of phantom listeners that dwelt in the lone house then stood listening in the quiet of the moonlight to that voice from the world of men, stood thronging the moonbeams on the dark stair that goes down to the empty hall. Hearkening in an air stirred and shaken by the lonely traveller's call, and he felt in his heart their strangeness, their stillness, answering his cry, while his horse moved, cropping the dark turf neath the starred and leafy sky, for he suddenly smote upon the door even louder and lifted his head. Tell them I came and no one answered, that I kept my word, he said. Never the least stir made the listeners, though every word he spake fell echoing through the shadowiness of the still house from the one man left awake. Ay, they heard his foot upon the stirrup, and the sound of iron on stone, and how the silence surged softly backward when the plunging hooves were gone. Haunted Houses by Henry W. Longfellow. All houses wherein men have lived and died are haunted houses. Through the open doors the harmless phantoms on their errands glide with feet that make no sound upon the floors. We meet them at the doorway, on the stair, along the passages they come and go, impalpable impressions on the air, a sense of something moving to and fro. There are more guests at table than the hosts invited. The illuminated hall is thronged with quiet, inoffensive ghosts as silent as the pictures on the wall. The stranger at my fireside cannot see the forms I see or hear the sounds I hear. He but perceives what is, while unto me all that has been is visible and clear. We have no title deeds to house or lands. Owners and occupants of earlier dates from graves forgotten stretch their hands. And hold in Mortmain still their old estates. The spirit world, around this world of sense, floats like an atmosphere, and everywhere wafts through these earthly mists and vapors dense a vital breath of more ethereal air. Our little lives are kept in equipoise by opposite attractions and desires, the struggle of the instinct that enjoys, and the more noble instinct that aspires. These perturbations, this perpetual jar of earthly wants and aspirations high, 
come from the influence of an unseen star, an undiscovered planet in our sky. And as the moon from some dark gate of cloud throws o'er the sea a floating bridge of light, across whose trembling planks our fancies crowd into this realm of mystery and night, so from the world of spirits there descends a bridge of light connecting it with this, o'er whose unsteady floor that sways and bends wander our thoughts above the dark abyss. The Beleaguered City by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow I have read in some old marvelous tale, some legend strange and vague, that a midnight host of spectres pale, beleaguered the walls of Prague. Beside the Moldau's rushing stream with the wan moon overhead, there stood as in an awful dream the army of the dead. White as a sea fog, landward bound, the spectral band was seen, and with a sorrowful deep sound the river flowed between. No other voice nor sound was there, no drum nor sentry's pace. The mist-like banners clasped the air as clouds with clouds embrace. And when the old cathedral bell proclaimed the morning prayer, the white pavilions rose and fell on the alarmed air. Down the broad valley, fast and far, the troubled army fled. Up rose the glorious morning star. The ghastly host was dead. I have read in the marvelous heart of man that strange and mystic scroll that an army of phantoms vast and wan beleaguer the human soul. Encamped beside life's rushing stream in fancy's misty light, gigantic shapes and shadows gleam portentous through the night. Upon its midnight battleground the spectral camp is seen, and with a sorrowful deep sound flows the river of life between. No other voice nor sound is there in the army of the grave. No other challenge breaks the air but the rushing of life's wave. And then the solemn and deep church bell entreats the soul to pray. The midnight phantoms feel the spell. The shadows sweep away. Down the broad veil of tears afar the spectral camp is fled. Faith shineth as a morning star. Our ghastly fears are dead. A Newport Romance by Brett Hart They say that she died of a broken heart. I tell the tale as t'was told to me. But her spirit lives, and her soul is part of this sad old house by the sea. Her lover was fickle and fine and French. It was more than a hundred years ago, when he sailed away from her arms, poor wench, with the Admiral Rochambeau. I marvel at what periwigged phrase won the heart of this sentimental Quaker, at what gold-laced speech of those modish days she listened, the mischief taker. But she kept the posies of Mionette that he gave, and ever as their bloom failed and faded, though with her tears still wet, her youth with her own exhaled. Till one night when the sea fog wrapped a shroud round spar and spire and tarn and tree, her soul went up on that lifted cloud from this sad old house by the sea. And ever since then, when the clock strikes two, she walks unbidden from room to room, and the air is filled as she passes through with a subtle, sad perfume. The delicate odor of Mionette, the ghost of a dead and gone bouquet, is all that tells her story. Yet could she think of a sweeter way? I sit in the sad old house tonight, myself a ghost from a farther sea, and I trust that this Quaker woman might, in courtesy, visit me. For the laugh is fled from the porch and lawn, and the bugle died from the fort on the hill, and the twitter of girls on the stairs is gone, and the grand piano is still. Somewhere in the darkness a clock strikes two, and there is no sound in the sad old house, but the long veranda dripping with dew, and in the wainscot a mouse. The light of my study lamp streams out from the library door, but has gone astray in the depths of the darkened hall. Small doubt, but the Quakeress knows the way. Was it the trick of a sense or rot, with outward watching and inward fret? 
but I swear that the air just now was fraught with the odor of Mionette. I open the window and seem almost, so still lies the ocean, to hear the beat of its great gulf artery off the coast and to bask in its tropic heat. In my neighbor's window the gaslights flare as the dancers swing in a waltz from Strauss. And I wonder now, could I fit that air to the song of this sad old house? And no odor of mionette there is, but the breath of morn on the dewy lawn. And maybe from causes as slight as this the quaint old legend was born. But the soul of that subtle, sad perfume, as the spiced embalmings, they say, outlast the mummy laid in his rocky tomb, awakens my buried past. And I think of the passion that shook my youth, of its aimless loves and its idle pains, and am thankful now for the certain truth that only the sweet remains. And I hear no rustle of stiff brocade, and I see no face at my library door, for now that the ghosts of my heart are laid, she is viewless forevermore. But whether she came as a faint perfume, or whether a spirit in a stole of white, I feel, as I pass from the darkened room, she has been with my soul tonight. A Legend by May Kendall Aye, an old story, yet it might have truth in it, who knows, of the heroine's breaking down one night just ere the curtain rose, and suddenly, when fear and doubt had shaken every heart, there stepped an unknown actress out to take the heroine's part. But oh, the magic of her face! And oh, the songs she sung, and oh, the rapture of the place, and oh, the flowers they flung. But she never stooped. They lay all night as when she turned away and left them, and the saddest light shone in her eyes of gray. She gave a smile in glancing round, and sighed, one fancied, then. But never they knew where she was bound, or saw her face again. But the old prompter, gray and frail, they heard him murmur low, It could only be Meg Coverdale, died thirty years ago, in that old part who took the town, and she was fair as fair as when they shut the coffin down on that gleam of her golden hair. And it wasn't hard to understand how a lass as fair as she could never rest in the promised land, where none but angels be. End of section number 14 Section 15 of The Haunted Hour, an anthology by Margaret Widemer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matt Benzing of Oxford, Ohio. Haunted Places, Part 2. A Midnight Visitor by Elizabeth Akers Allen After all the house is dark, and the last soft step is still, and the M bow's clear cut shadow flickers on the window sill, when the village lights are out and the watchdogs all asleep, and the misty silver radiance makes the shade look black and deep, when so silent is the night not a dead leaf dares to fall. And I only hear the death watch ticking, ticking in the wall. When no hidden mouse dares gnaw at the silence dead and dumb, And the very air seems waiting for a something that should come, Suddenly there stands my guest. Whence he came I cannot see, Not a door has swung before him, Not a hand touched latch or key, not a rustle stirred the air, yet he stands there brave and mute, in his eyes a look of greeting, in his hand an old-time flute. Then, with all the courtly grace of the old colonial school, from the curtain-shadowed corner forth he draws a three-legged stool. Ah, it was not there before. Search as closely as I may, I can never, never find it, when I look for it by day. 
places it beside my bed, and while silently I gaze, spellbound by his mystic presence, seats himself thereon and plays. Gracious, stately, grave, and tall, always dressed from crown to toe in the quaint, elaborate fashion of a hundred years ago. Doublet, small clothes, silk-clocked hose, where's my midnight melodist? Snowy ruffles in his bosom, snowy ruffles at his wrist. Silver buckle at his knee, silver buckle on his shoe, powdered hair smoothed back and plaited in a stiff old-fashioned queue. If I stir, he vanishes. If I speak, he flits away. If I lie in utter silence, he will sit for hours and play, play old wailing minor airs, melancholy, wild, and slow. Such may hap as pleased the maidens of a hundred years ago. All in vain I wait to hear ghostly histories of wrong, unconfessed and unforgiven, unavenged and suffered long. Not a story does he tell, not a single word he says, only sits and gazes at me steadily, and plays and plays. Who is he, my midnight guest? Wherefore does he haunt me so, coming from the misty shadows of a hundred years ago? Haunted by Amy Lowell See? He trails his toes through the long streaks of moonlight, and the nails of his fingers glitter. They claw and flash among the treetops. His lips suck at my open window, and his breath creeps about my body and lies in pools under my knees. I can see his mouth sway and wobble, sticking itself against the window jams. But the moonlight is bright upon the floor, without a shadow. Hark, a hare is straggling in the forest, and the wind tears a shutter from the wall. The Little Green Orchard by Walter de la Mar Someone is always sitting there in the little green orchard. Even when the sun is high in noon's unclouded sky and faintly droning goes the bee from rose to rose, someone in shadow is sitting there in the little green orchard. Yes, and when twilight's falling softly on the little green orchard, when the gray dew distills and every flower cup fills, when the last blackbird says, what, what, and goes her way, shh, I have heard voices calling softly in the little green orchard. Not that I am afraid of being there in the little green orchard. Why, when the moon's been bright, shedding her lonesome light, and moths like ghosties come, and the horned snail leaves home, I've stayed there whispering and listening there in the little green orchard. Only it's strange to be feeling there in the little green orchard. Whether you paint or draw, dig, hammer, chop, or saw, when you are most alone, all but the silence gone, Someone is waiting and watching there in the little green orchard. Fireflies by Luis Driscoll What are you fireflies that come as daylight dies? Are you the old, old dead creeping through the long grass to see the green leaves move and feel the light wind pass? The larkspur in my garden is a sea of rose and blue. The white moth is a ghost ship drifting through. The shadows fall like lilacs raining from a garden sky. Pollen-laden bees go home. Bird songs die. The honeysuckle breaks a flask, and a breeze on pleasure bent catches in her little hands the sharp scent. In the darkness and the dew, come the little flying flames. Are they the forgotten dead without names? Did they love the leaves and wind, grass and gardens long ago, with a love that draws them home where things grow? For an hour with green leaves, love immortal leaped to flame. From the earth into the night old hearts came. What are you fireflies that come as the daylight dies. The Little Ghost 
by Edna St. Vincent Millay. I knew her for a little ghost that in my garden walked. The wall was high, higher than most, and the green gate was locked. And yet I did not think of that till after she was gone. I knew her by the broad white hat all ruffled she had on by the dear ruffles round her feet, by her small hands that hung in their lace mitts, austere and sweet, her gown's white folds among. I watched to see if she would stay, what she would do. And, oh, she looked as if she liked the way I let my garden grow. She bent above my favorite mint with conscious garden grace. She smiled and smiled. There was no hint of sadness in her face. She held her gown on either side to let her slippers show, and up the walk she went with pride, the way great ladies go. And where the wall is built in new, and is of ivy bare, she paused, then opened and passed through a gate that once was there. Haunted by Louis Untermeyer Between the moss and stone, the lonely lilies rise, wasted and overgrown the tangled garden lies. Weeds climb about the stoop and clutch the crumbling walls, the drowsy grasses droop, the night wind falls. The place is like a wood, no sign is there to tell, where rose and iris stood that once she loved so well, where flocks and asters grew, a leafless thornbush stands and shrubs that never knew her tender hands. Over the broken fence the moonbeams trail their shrouds. Their tattered cerements cling to the gauzy clouds in ribbons frayed and thin. And startled by the light, silence shrinks deeper in the depths of night. Useless lie spades and rakes, rusts on the garden tools. Yet, where moonlight makes nebulous silver pools, a ghostly shape is cast. Something unseen has stirred. Was it a breeze that passed? Was it a bird? Dead roses lift their heads out of a grassy tomb. From ruined pansy beds, a thousand pansies bloom. The gate is opened wide. The garden that has been now blossoms like a bride. Who? entered in ghosts by madison kawine low weed climb cliffs over which at noon the sea mists swoon wind twisted pines through which the crow goes winging slow dim fields the sower never sows or reaps or mows and near the sea is a ghostly house of stone where all is old and lone a garden Falling in decay, where statues gray peer broken out of tangle weed and thorny seed. Satyr and nymph that once made love by walk and grove, and near a fountain shattered green with mold, a sundial like an old. Like some sad life bereft, to musing left, the house stands, love and youth, both gone in sooth, but still it sits and dreams and round it seems some memory of the past still young and fair haunting each crumbling stair and suddenly one dimly sees come through the trees a woman like a wild moss rose a man who goes softly and by the dial they kiss a while then drowsily the mists blow round them wan and they like ghosts are gone the Three Ghosts by Theodosia Garrison The three ghosts on the lonely road spake each to one another. Whence came that stain upon your mouth no lifted hand can cover? From eating of forbidden fruit, brother, my brother. The three ghosts on the sunless road spake each to one another. Whence came that red burn on your foot no dust or ash may cover? I stamped a neighbor's hearth flame out, brother, my brother. The three ghosts on the windless road spake each to one another. Whence came that blood upon thy hand no other hand may cover? From breaking of a woman's heart, brother, my brother. Yet on the earth clean men we walked, 
glutton and thief and lover. White flesh and fair it hid our stains that no man might discover. Naked the soul goes up to God, brother, my brother. End of section 15. Recording by Matt Benzing of Oxford, Ohio. Section 16 of The Haunted Hour, an anthology by Margaret Wiedemer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. You know the old, while I know the new. After Death by Christina Rossetti. The curtains were half drawn, the floor was swept and strewn with rushes. Rosemary and May lay thick upon the bed on which I lay, where through the lattice ivy shadows crept. He leaned above me, thinking that I slept, and could not hear him, but I heard him say, Poor child, poor child. And as he turned away, came a deep silence, and I knew he wept. He did not touch the shroud or raise the fold that hid my face, or take my hand in his, or ruffle the smooth pillows for my head. He did not love me living, but once dead. He pitied me, and very sweet it is to know he still is warm, though I am cold. The Passerby by Edith M. Thomas Step lightly across the floor, and somewhat more tender be. There were many that passed my door, many that sought after me. I gave them the passing word. Ah, why did I give thee more? I gave thee what could not be heard, what had not been given before. The beat of my heart I gave, and I give thee this flower on my grave. My face in the flower thou may see step lightly across the floor at home by christina rossetti when i was dead my spirit turned to seek the much frequented house i passed the door and saw my friends feasting beneath green orange boughs from hand to hand they pushed the wine they sucked the pulp of plum and peach they sang, they jested, and they laughed, for each was loved of each. I listened to their honest chat, said one, Tomorrow we shall be, plod, plod along the featureless sands, and coasting miles and miles of sea, said one, Before the turn of tide, we will achieve the eyrie seat, said one, Tomorrow shall be like, today but much more sweet. Tomorrow, said they, strong with hope, and dwelt upon the pleasant way. Tomorrow, cried they one and all, while no one spoke of yesterday. Their life stood full at blessed noon. I, only I had passed away. Tomorrow and today, they cried, I was of yesterday. I shivered comfortless, but cast no chill across the tablecloth. I all forgotten shivered sad to stay and yet to part how loth i passed from the familiar room i who from love had passed away like the remembrance of a guest that tarrieth but a day the return by mina irving i pushed the tangled grass away and lifted up the stone and flitted down the churchyard path of grasses overgrown. I halted at my mother's door and shook the rusty catch. The wind is rising fast, she said. It rattles at the latch. I crossed the street and paused again before my husband's house. My baby sat upon his knee as quiet as a mouse. I pulled the muslin curtain by. He rose the blinds to draw. I feel a draft upon my back. The night is cold and raw. I met a man who loved me well in days ere I was wed. 
he did not hear he did not see so silently i fled when i found my poor old dog though blind and deaf was he and feeble with his many years he turned and followed me the room's width by elizabeth stuart phelps ward i think if i should cross the room far as fear should stand beside you like a thought touch you dear like a fancy to your sad heart it would seem that my vision passed and prayed you or my dream then you would look with lonely eyes lift your head and you would stir and sigh and say she is dead baffled by death and love i lean through the gloom o lord of life am i forbid to cross the room haunted by don marquis a ghost is a freak of a sick man's brain then why do you start and shiver so that's the sob and drip of a leaky drain but it sounds like another noise we know the heavy drops drummed red and slow the drops ran down as slow as fate do ye hear them still it was long ago but here in the shadows i wait and wait spirits there be that pass in peace mine passed in a whirl of wrath and dole and the hour that your choking breath shall cease i will get my grip on your naked soul nor pity may stay nor prayer cajole i would drag ye whining from hell's own gate to me to me you must pay the toll and here in the shadows i wait i wait the dead they are dead they are out of the way and the ghost is a whim of an ailing mind then why did ye whiten with fear to-day when ye heard a voice in the calling wind why did ye falter and look behind at the creeping mist when the hour grew late ye would see my face were ye stricken blind and here in the shadows i wait i wait drink and forget make merry and boast but the boast rings false and the jest is thin in the hour that i meet you ghost to ghost stripped to the flesh that you skulk within stripped to the coward soul where of its sin you shall learn you shall learn whether dead men hate ah a weary time has the waiting been but here in the shadows i wait i wait End of section 16section 17 of the haunted hour an anthology by margaret widmer this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org recording by gloria begaman somerville south carolina my love that was so true part 1 one out of doors sarah platt a ghost is he afraid to be a ghost a ghost it breaks my heart to think of it something that wavers in the moon at most something that wanders something that must flit from morning from the bird's breath and the dew oh if i knew oh if i only knew something so weirdly wan so weirdly still o oh, yearning lips that our warm blood can flush follow it with your kisses if you will o oh, beating heart think of its helpless hush o oh, bitterest of all to feel we fear something that was so near that was so dear no no he is no ghost he could not be something that hides forlorn in frost and briar something shut outside in the dark while we laugh and forget by the familiar fire something whose moan we call the wind whose sound but as raindrops in our human ears sailing beyond seas jean ingelow 
methought the stars were blinking bright and the old brig's sail unfurled i said i will sail to my love this night at the other side of the world i stepped aboard we sailed so fast the sun shot up from the bourne but a dove that perched upon the mast did mourn and mourn and mourn o oh, fair dove o oh, fawn dove and dove with the white white breast let me alone the dream is my own and my heart is full of rest my true love fares on this great hill feeding his sheep for a i looked in his hut but all was still my love was gone away i went to gaze in the forest creek and the dove mourned on apace no flame did flash nor fair blue reek rose up to show me his place o oh, last love o oh, first love my love with the true true heart to think i have come to this your home and yet we are apart my love he stood at my right hand his eyes were grave and sweet methought he said in this far land oh is it thus we meet o oh, maid most dear i am not here i have no place no part no dwelling more by sea or shore but only in thy heart o oh, fair dove o oh, fawn dove till night rose over the bourne the dove on the mast as we sailed fast did mourn and mourn and mourn betrayal aylan kilmer four hundred times the glass had run and seven times the moon had died since my lover rode in his silver mail away from his new-made bride a ghost light gleamed in the field beyond and a wet wet wind blew in from the sea when out of the mist my own true love came up and stood by me my heart leaped up that had been still my voice rang out that had been sad till my sister left her busy wheel to see what made me glad she saw my arms about his neck she saw my head upon his breast oh why did my sister hate me so that she would not let me rest loud then laughed my cruel sister false and fair of face was she oh that is never your own true love for he lies dead in a far country i loosed the clasp of my clinging arms and his shining face grew still and white my tears ran down like bitter rain as i watched him fade from sight may the salt sea bury me in its waves may the mountains fall and cover my head since i had not faith in my only love when he came back from the dead the true lover a e houseman the lad came to the door at night when lovers crowned their vows and whistled soft and out of sight in shadow of the boughs i shall not vex you with my face henceforth my love for a so take me in your arms a space before the east is gray when i from hence away am past i shall not find a bride and you shall be the first and last i ever lay beside she heard and went and knew not why her heart to his she laid light was the air beneath the sky but dark under the shade oh do you breathe lad that your breast seems not to rise and fall and here upon my bosom pressed there beats no heart at all oh loud my girl it once would knock you should have felt it then but since for you i stopped the clock it never goes again oh lad what is it lad that drops wet from your neck on mine what is it falling on my lips my lad that tastes like brine 
oh like enough tis blood my dear for when the knife has slit the throat across from ear to ear twill bleed because of it under the stars the air was light but dark below the boughs the still air of the speechless night when lovers crown their vows haunted g b stuart when candle flames burn blue between the night and morning i know that it is you my love that was so true and that i killed with scorning the watchdogs howl and bay i pale and leave off smiling only the other day i held your heart in play intent upon beguiling a little while ago i wrung your soul with sighing or brought a sudden glow into your cheek by low soft answers in replying my life was all disguise a mask of feints and fancies i used to lift my eyes and take you by surprise with smiles and upward glances and now where'er i go your sad ghost follows after and blue the flame burns low and doors creak to and fro and silent grows the laughter the white moth sir arthur quiller couch if a leaf rustled she would start and yet she died a year ago how had so frail a thing the heart to journey where she trembled so and do they turn and turn in fright those little feet in so much night the light above the poet's head streamed on the page and on the cloth and twice and thrice there buffeted on the black pane a white-winged moth twas annie's soul that beat outside and open 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 cried i could not find the way to god there were too many flaming suns for signposts and the fearful road let over wastes where millions of flaming comets hissed and burned i was bewildered and i turned oh it was easy then i knew your window and no star beside look up and take me back to you he rose and thrust the window wide twas but because his brain was hot with rhyming for he saw her not but poets polishing a phrase show anger over trivial things and as she blundered in the blaze towards him on ecstatic wings he raised a hand and smote her dead then wrote that i had died instead the ghost walter de la mare who knocks i who was beautiful beyond all dreams to restore i from the roots of the dark thorn am hither and a knock on the door who speaks i once was my speech sweet as the birds on the air when echo lurks by the waters to heed tis i speak thee fair dark is the hour i and cold lone is my house ah but mine sight touch lips eyes yearn in vain long dead these to thine silence silence still faint on the porch break the flames of the stars in gloom groped a hope-wearied hand over keys bolts and bars a face peered all the gray night in chaos of vacancy shone not but vast sorrow was there the sweet cheat gone end of section seventeen Section 18 of The Haunted Hour, an anthology by Margaret Widemar. This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Matt Bounds My Love That Was So True, Part 2 Luke Havergal by Edwin Arlington Robinson Go to the western gate, Luke Havergal, There where the vines cling crimson on the wall, And in the twilight wait for what will come. The wind will moan, the leaves will whisper some. Whisper of her, and strike you as they fall. But go, and if you trust her, she will call. Go to the western gate, Luke Havergal. Luke Havergal. No, there is not a dawn in eastern skies To rift the fiery night that's in your eyes. But there, where western glooms are gathering, The dark will end the dark, if anything. God slays himself with every leaf that flies, And hell is more than half of paradise. No, there is not a dawn in eastern skies, In eastern skies. Out of the grave I come to tell you this, out of the grave I come to quench the kiss That flames upon your forehead with a glow That blinds you to the way that you must go. Yes, there is yet one way to where she is. Bitter, but one that faith can never miss. Out of the grave I come to tell you this. To tell you this. There is the western gate, Luke Havergal. There are the crimson leaves upon the wall. Go, for the winds are tearing them away. Nor think to riddle the dead words that they say, nor any more to feel them as they fall, but go, and if you trust her, she will call. There is the western gate, Luke Havergal. Luke Havergal. The Highwayman by Alfred Noyes The wind was a torrent of darkness among the gusty trees. The moon was a ghostly galleon tossed upon cloudy seas. The road was a ribbon of moonlight over the purple moor, and the highwayman came riding, riding, riding. The highwayman came riding up to the old inn door. He'd a French cocked hat on his forehead, a bunch of lace at his chin, a coat of the claret velvet and breeches of brown doe skin. They fitted with never a wrinkle. His boots were up to the thigh, and he rode with a jeweled twinkle, his pistol butts a twinkle, his rapier hilt a twinkle, under the jeweled sky. Over the cobbles he clattered and clashed in the dark inn yard, and he tapped with his whip on the shutters, but all was locked and barred. He whistled a tune to the window, and who should be waiting there but the landlord's black eyed daughter, Bess, the landlord's daughter, plaiting a dark red love knot into her long black hair. And dark in the dark old inn-yard, a stable wicket creaked, Where Tim the ostler listened, his face was white and peaked. His eyes were hollows of madness, his hair like mouldy hay, But he loved the landlord's daughter, the landlord's red-lipped daughter. Dumb as a dog, he listened, and he heard the robber say, One kiss, my bonny sweetheart, I'm after a prize tonight, But I shall be back with the yellow gold before the morning light. Yet, if they press me sharply, and harry me through the day, then look for me by moonlight, watch for me by moonlight, I'll come to thee by moonlight, though hell should bar the way. He rose upright in the stirrups, he scarce could reach her hand, but she loosened her hair at the casement, his face burnt like a brand, as the black cascade of perfume came tumbling over his breast, and he kissed its waves in the moonlight, oh, sweet black waves in the moonlight, then he tugged at his reins in the moonlight and galloped away to the west. He did not come in the dawning, he did not come at noon, and out of the tawny sunset before the rise of the moon, when the road was a gypsy's ribbon looping the purple moor, a redcoat troop came marching, 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 King George's men came marching up to the old inn door. They said no word to the landlord, they drank his ale instead, but they gagged his daughter and bound her to the foot of her narrow bed. Two of them knelt at her casement, with muskets at their side. There was death at every window, and hell at one dark window, for Bess could see through her casement the road that he would ride. 
They had tied her up to attention with many a sniggering jest. They had bound a musket beside her with the barrel beneath her breast. Now keep good watch, and they kissed her. She heard the dead man say, Look for me by moonlight. Watch for me by moonlight. I'll come to thee by moonlight, though hell should bar the way. She twisted her hands behind her, but all the knots held good. She writhed her hands till her fingers were wet with sweat or blood. They stretched and strained in the darkness, and the hours crawled by like years, till now, on the stroke of midnight, cold on the stroke of midnight, the tip of one finger touched it. The trigger, at least, was hers. The tip of one finger touched it. She strove no more for the rest. Up she stood to attention, with the barrel beneath her breast. She would not risk their hearing. She would not strive again, for the road lay bare in the moonlight, blank and bare in the moonlight, and the blood of her veins in the moonlight throbbed to her love's refrain. Clot, 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 clot. Had they heard it? The horse hoofs ringing clear. Clot, 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 clot. In the distance? Were they deaf that they did not hear? Down the ribbon of moonlight, over the brow of the hill, the highwayman came riding, riding, riding. The redcoats looked to their priming. She stood up straight and still. Clot, clot in the frosty silence. Clot, clot in the echoing night. Nearer he came and nearer. Her face was like a light. Her eyes grew wide for a moment. She drew one last deep breath. Then her finger moved in the moonlight. Her musket shattered the moonlight, shattered her breast in the moonlight, and warned him with her death. He turned. He spurred him westward. He did not know who stood, bowed with her head o'er the musket, drenched with her own red blood. Not till the dawn he heard it, and slowly blanched to hear how Bess, the landlord's daughter, the landlord's black-eyed daughter, had watched for her love in the moonlight and died in the darkness there. Back he spurred like a madman, shrieking a curse to the sky, with the white road smoking behind him and his rapier brandished high. Blood red were his spurs of the golden moon, wine red was his velvet coat, when they shot him down on the highway down like a dog on the highway, and he lay in his blood on the highway, with a bunch of lace at his throat. And still of a winter's night, they say, when the wind is in the trees, when the moon is a ghostly galleon tossed upon cloudy seas, when the road is a ribbon of moonlight over the purple moor, a highwayman comes riding, 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 a highwayman comes riding, up to the old inn door. Over the cobbles he clatters and clangs in the dark inn yard, and he taps with his whip on the shutters, but all is locked and barred. He whistles a tune to the window, and who should be waiting there but the landlord's black eyed daughter, Bess, the landlord's daughter, plaiting a dark red love knot into her long black hair. End of section 18. Section 19 of The Haunted Hour, an anthology by Margaret Widmer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Josh Kibbe. My Love That Was So True, Part 3. The Blue Closet by William Morris. The Damozels. Lady Alice, Lady Louise, between the wash of the tumbling seas, we are ready to sing, if you so please. So lay your long hands on the keys, sing La Date Paris. And ever the great bell overhead boomed in the wind a knell for the dead, though no one told it a knell for the dead. Lady Louise Sister, let the measure swell, not too loud, for you sing not well if you drown the faint boom of the bell. He is weary, so am I. And ever the chevron overhead flapped on the banner of the dead. Was he asleep, or was he dead? Lady Alice Alice the Queen and Louise the Queen, two demoiselles wearing purple and green, four lone ladies dwelling here from day to day and year to year. And there is none to let us go, to break the locks of the doors below, or shovel away the heaped-up snow. And when we die no man will know that we are dead. But they give us leave once every year on Christmas Eve, to sing in the closet blue one song, and we should be so long, so long, if we dared in singing, for dream on dream they float on in a happy stream. 
They float from the gold strings, float from the keys, float from the opened lips of Louise. But alas, the sea salt oozes through the chinks of the tiles of the closet blue. And ever the great bell overhead booms in the wind a knell for the dead. The wind plays on it a knell for the dead. They sing all together. How long ago was it, how long ago, he came to this tower with hands full of snow? Kneel down, O oh love Louise, kneel down, he said, and sprinkled the dusty snow over my head. He watched the snow melting, it ran through my hair, ran over my shoulders, white shoulders and bare. I cannot weep for thee, poor love Louise, for my tears are all hidden deep under the seas. In a golden blue casket she keeps all my tears, but my eyes are no longer blue as in old years. Yea, they grow gray with time, grow small and dry. I am so feeble now, would I might die. And in truth the great bell overhead had left off pealing for the dead, perchance because the wind was dead. Will he come back again, or is he dead? Or is he sleeping, my scarf round his head? Or did they strangle him as he lay there with the long scarlet scarf I used to wear? Only I pray thee, Lord, let him come here. Both his soul and his body to me are most dear. Dear Lord that loves me, I wait to receive either body or spirit this wild Christmas Eve. Through the floor shot up a lily red, with a patch of earth from the land of the dead, for he was strong in the land of the dead. What matter that his cheeks were pale, his kind kissed lips all gray? O oh, love Louise, have you waited long? O oh, my Lord Arthur, yea. What if his hair that brushed her cheek was stiff with frozen rhyme? His eyes were grown quite blue again, as in the happy time. O oh, love Louise, this is the key of the happy golden land. O oh, sisters, cross the bridge with me, my eyes are full of sand. What matter that I cannot see if he take me by the hand? And ever the great bell overhead and the tumbling sea mourned for the dead, for their song ceased and they were dead. The Ghost's Petition by Christina Georgina Rossetti There's a footstep coming, look out and see. The leaves are falling, the wind is calling, no one cometh across the lea. There's a footstep coming, oh, sister, look. The ripple flashes, the white foam dashes, no one cometh across the brook. But he promised that he would come. Tonight, tomorrow, in joy or sorrow, he must keep his word and must come home. For he promised that he would come. His word was given from earth to heaven, he must keep his word and must come home. Go to sleep, my sweet sister Jane. You can slumber who need not number, hour after hour in doubt and pain. I shall sit here a while and watch. Listening, hoping, for one hand groping, in deep shadow to find the latch. After the dark and before the light, one lay sleeping, and one sat weeping, who had watched and wept the weary night. After the night and before the day, one lay sleeping, and one sat weeping, watching, weeping for one away. There came a footstep climbing the stair. Someone standing out on the landing shook the door like a puff of air. Shook the door, and in he passed. Did he enter? In the room's center stood her husband, the door shut fast. Oh, Robin, but you are cold, chilled with the night dew, so lily-white you look like a stray lamb from our fold. Oh, Robin, but you are late, come and sit near me, sit here and cheer me, blue the flame burnt in the grate. Lay not down your head on my breast, I cannot hold you, kind wife, nor fold you, in the shelter that you love best. Feel not after my clasping hand, I am but a shadow, come from the meadow, where many lie but no tree can stand. We are trees that have shed their leaves. Our heads lie low there, but no tears flow there. Only I grieve for my wife who grieves. I could rest if you would not moan. Hour after hour, I have no power to shut my ears as I lie alone. I could rest if you would not cry. But there's no sleeping while you sit weeping, watching, weeping so bitterly. Woe's me, woe's me, for this I have heard. O oh, night of sorrow, O oh, black tomorrow, is it thus that you keep your word? O oh, you who used so to shelter me, warm from the least wind, why now the east wind is warmer than you whom I quake to see? O oh, my husband of flesh and blood, for whom my mother I left, and brother and all I had accounting it good, what do you do there under the ground, in the dark hollow, I'm fain to follow, what do you do there, what have you found? What I do there I must not tell, but I have plenty, kind wife content ye, it is well with us, it is well. Tender hand hath made our nest, our fear is ended, our hope is blended with present pleasure, and we have rest. Oh, but Robin, I'm fain to come, if your present days are so pleasant, for my days are so wearisome. Yet I'll dry my tears for your sake. Why should I tease you who cannot please you any more with the pains I take? 
He and She by Sir Edwin Arnold She is dead, they said to him, come away, Kiss her and leave her, thy love is clay. They smoothed her tresses of dark brown hair, On her forehead of stone they laid it fair. Over her eyes that gazed too much, They drew the lids with a gentle touch. With a tender touch they closed up well The sweet thin lips that had secrets to tell. Above her brows and beautiful face They tied her veil and her marriage lace. And drew on her white feet her white silk shoes, Which were the whitest no eye could choose. And over her bosom they crossed her hands, Come away, they said, God understands. And there was silence and nothing there But silence and sense of eglantere. And jasmine and roses and rosemary, And they said, As a lady should lie, lie she. And they held their breath till they left the room, With a shudder, a glance at its stillness and gloom. But he who loved her too well to dread, The sweet, the stately, the beautiful dead, He lit his lamp and he took the key, And turned it, alone again he and she. He and she, but she would not speak, Though he kissed in the old place the quiet cheek. He and she, yet she would not smile, Though he called her the name she loved erewhile. He and she, still she did not move To any passionate whisper of love. Then he said, Cold lips and breast without breath, Is there no voice or language of death, Dumb to the ear and still to the sense, But to heart and soul distinct and tense? See now, I will listen with soul, not ear. What is the secret of dying, dear? Was it the infinite wonder of all That you ever could let life's flower fall? Or was it a greater marvel to feel The perfect calm o'er the agony steal? Was the miracle greater to find out deep Beyond all dreams sink downward that sleep? Did life roll back its record, dear, And show, as they say it does, past things clear? And was it the innermost heart of the bliss To find out so what a wisdom love is? O oh, perfect dead! O oh, dead most dear! I hold the breath of my soul to hear. I listen as deep as the terrible hell, as high as to heaven, and you do not tell. There must be pleasure in dying, sweet, to make you so placid from head to feet. I would tell you, darling, if I were dead, and twere your hot tears upon my brow shed, I would say, though the angel of death had laid his sword on my lips to keep it unsaid, you should not ask vainly, with streaming eyes, which of all deaths was the chiefest surprise, the very strangest and suddenest thing, of all the surprises that dying must bring. Ah, foolish world! O oh, most kind dead, though he told me who will believe it was said, who will believe that he heard her say with the old sweet voice in the dear old way? The utmost wonder is this, I hear, and see you and love you and kiss you, dear, and am your angel who was your bride, and know that though dead, I have never died. End of section 19section twenty of the haunted hour an anthology by margaret widemar this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nan dodge shapes of doom part one the dead coach by katherine tynan at night, when sick folk wakeful lie, I heard the dead coach passing by, Heard it passing wild and fleet, And knew my time had come not yet. Click, clack, click, clack, the hooves went past, Who takes the dead coach travels fast. On and away through the wild night The dead must rest ere morning light. If one might follow on its track The coach and horses midnight black Within should sit a shape of doom That beckons one and all to come. God pity them to-night who wait To hear the dead coach at their gate, And him who hears, though sense be dim, A mournful dead coach stop for him. He shall go down with a still face And mount the steps and take his place. The door be shut, the order said, how fast the pace is with the dead. Click, clack, click, clack, the hour is chill. The dead coach climbs the distant hill. Now God, the Father of us all, wipe thou the widow's tears that fall. End of poem. Shapes of Doom, Part One Dead Folk's Fairy by Rosamond Marriott Watson tis they of a verity they are calling thin and shrill we maun arise and put to sea we maun guide the dead their will 
We maun ferry them o'er the fame, for they draw us as they list. We maun bear the dead folk came through the murk and the soft sea mist. But how can I gang the nicht when I'm new come hame fra sea, when my heart is sair for the sicht o' my lass that langs for me? O oh, your lassie lies asleep, and sighed to your bellernies twa. The cliff paths stay and steep, and the dead folk cry and caw. O oh, say holy step it we, for the nicht was murk and lone, with never a sign to see, but the voices all around. We laid to the salt sea shore, and the boat dipped low with the tide, as she micht had dipped with a score, and her ain three sails beside. O oh, the boat she settled low, till her gunwale kissed the fame, and she did na loop nor row, as she bare the dead folk hame. But she aye guide swift and licht, and we nothing saw nor wist, who sailed o' the boat that nicht, through the murk and the soft sea mist. There was never a sign to see but a misty shore, and lo, never a word spake we, but the boat she licked and slow, and a cold sigh stirred my hair, and a cold hand touched my wrist, and my heart sank cold and sair, I the murk and the soft sea mist. Then the wind raise up with the main, twas a wafer wind, and wheat, like a dead soul wood with pain, like a barony wild with freight. But the boat raid swift and licht, say we won the land full soon, and the shore showed wan and white by the glint of the waning moon. We stepped out o'er the sand where the uncool tide had been, and Black Donald caught my hand and covered up his een. For there in the wind and wheat, or ever I saw nor wist, my Jean and her wains lay cold at my feet in the murk and the soft sea mist. And it's o oh for my bonny Jean, and it's o oh for my bairnies twa, it's o oh and o oh for the watchet een and the steps that are gone awa, awa to the silent place, or ever I saw nor wist, though I wot wi twa went face to face through the murk and the saft sea mist. End of poem. Shapes of Doom. Part One Keith of Ravelston by Sidney Dobell The murmur of the morning ghost that keeps the shadowy kine, O Keith of Ravelston, the sorrows of thy line, Ravelston, Ravelston, the stile beneath the tree, the maid that kept her mother's kine, the song that sang she. She sang her song, she kept her kind, she sat beneath the thorn, while Andrew Keith of Ravelston rode through the Monday morn. His henchmen sing, his hawk-bells ring, his belted jewels shine. O Keith of Ravelston, the sorrows of thy line. Year after year, where Andrew came, comes evening down the glade, and still there sits a moonshine ghost where sat the sunshine maid. Her misty hair is faint and fair, she keeps the shadowy kine. O Keith of Ravelston, the sorrows of thy line. I lay my hands upon the stile, the stile is lone and cold. The burny that goes babbling by says naught that can be told. Yet stranger here from year to year, she keeps her shadowy kine. O Keith of Ravelston, the sorrows of thy line. Step out three steps where Andrew stood. Why blanch thy cheeks for fear? The ancient style is not alone, tis not the burn I hear. She makes her immemorial moan, she keeps her shadowy kine. O Keith of Ravelston, the sorrows of thy line. End of poem. Shapes of Doom, Part One. THE FETCH BY DORA SIGERSON SHORTER What makes you so late at the tryst? What caused you so long to be? I have waited a weary time for the hour you promised me. Oh, glad were I here by your side full many an hour ago, but for what there passed on the road all so mournfully and so slow. 
and what have you met on the road that kept you so long and so late oh full many an hour has gone since i left my father's gate as i hastened on in the gloom by the road to you to-night i passed the corpse of a young maid all clad in a shroud of white and was she some friend once cherished or was she a sister dead that you left your own true lover till the trysting hour had sped i could not see who it might be her face was hidden away but i had to turn and follow wherever her resting lay and did it go up by the town or went it down by the lake i know there are but two churchyards where a corpse its rest may take they did not go by the town nor by the lake stayed their feet but buried the corpse all silently where the four cross-roads meet and it was so strange a sight that you should go like a child thus to leave me to wait forgotten by a passing sight beguiled oh i heard them whisper my name each mourner that passed by me and i had to follow their path though their faces i could not see and right well i would like to know who this fair young maid might be so take my hand my own true love and hasten along with me he did not go down by the lake he did not go by the town, but carried her to the four cross-roads, and there he did set her down. Now I see no track of a foot, I see no mark of a spade, and I know well in this white road there never a grave was made. He took her hand in his right hand, and he led her to town away, and there he questioned the old priest, did he bury a maid that day? He took her hand in his right hand, down to the church by the lake and there he questioned a young priest if a maiden her life did take but there was no tale of death in all the parish round and neither had heard of a maid thus put in unholy ground he loosed her hand from his hand and turned on his heel away i know you are false he said from the lie you told to-day and she said oh what evil things did to-night my senses take she knelt down by the waterside and wept as her heart would break and she said oh what a fairy sight was it thus my grief to see i'll sleep well neath the still water since my love has turned on me and her love he went to the north and far to the south went he but still he heard her distant voice call weeping so bitterly he could not rest in the daytime he could not sleep in the night hastened back to the old road with the trysting place in sight what first he heard was his love's name and keening both loud and long what first he saw was his love's face at the head of a morning throng and white she was as the dead are and never a move made she but passed him by on her black pall still sleeping so peacefully and cold she was as the dead are and never a word she spake when they said unholy is her grave since she her life did take silent she was as the dead are and never a cry she made when there came more sad than the keening the ring of a digging spade no rest they gave in the town church no grave by the lake so sweet but buried her in unholy ground where the four cross roads do meet End of poem. End of section 20. Shapes of Doom, part 1. Recording by Nan Dodge. Section 21 of The Haunted Hour, an anthology by Margaret Whittemore. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by E.J. Wiley Shapes of Doom, Part 2 The Banshee by Dora Sigerson Shorter God be between us and all harm, for I tonight have seen a banshee in the shadow pass along the dark boreen. And as she went she keened and cried and combed her long white hair, she stopped at Molly Riley's door and sobbed till midnight there. And is it for himself, she moans, who is so far away? 
or is it Molly Riley's death? She cries until the day. Now Molly thinks her man has gone, a sailor lad to be. She puts a candle at her door each night for him to see. But he is off to Galway town, and who dare tell her this? Enchanted by a woman's eyes, half maddened by her kiss. So as we go by Molly's door, we look towards the sea and say, May God bring home your lad wherever he may be. I pray it may be Molly's self, the banshee keens and cries, for who dare breathe the tale to her, be it her man who dies. But there is sorrow on the way, for I tonight have seen a banshee in the shadow pass along the dark boreen. Shapes of Doom, Part 2 The Seven Whistlers by Alice E. Gillington Whistling strangely, whistling sadly, whistling sweet and clear, the seven whistlers have passed thy house, Pentron of Borthmere. It was not in the morning, nor the noonday's golden grace. It was in the dead waste midnight, when the tide yelped loud in the race. The tide swings round in the race, and they're planing wished and low, and they come from the gray sea marshes, where the gray sea lavenders grow. And the cotton grass sways to and fro, and the gore-sprint sundews thrive with oozy hands alive. Canst hear the curlews whistle through the dreamings dark and drear? How they're crying, 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 Pentron of Porthmere. Shall the hatchment, moldering grimly in yon church amid the sands, Stay trouble from thy household, or the carven cherub hands, which hold thy shield to the font, or the gauntlets on the wall, keep evil from its onward course as the great tides rise and fall? The great tides rise and fall, and the cave sucks in the breath of the wave when it runs with tossing spray, and the ground sea rattles of death. I rise in the shadows, I saith, where the mermaid's kettle sings, and the black shag flaps his wings. I, the green sea mountain leaping, may lead horror in its rear. When thy drenched sail leans to its yawning trough, Pentron of Porthmere. Yet the stoop waits at thy doorway for its load of glittering ore, and thy ships lie on the tideway, and thy flocks along the moor. And thine irishes gleam softly when the October moonbeams wane. When in the bay, all shining, the fishers set the seine, the fishers cast the seine, and tis heva in the town, and from the watch rock on the hill, the hewers are shouting down. And ye hoist the mainsail brown, as over the deep sea roll, the lurker follows the shoal, to follow, and to follow, in the moonshine silver clear, when the halyards creak to thy dipping sail, Pentron of Porthmere. And wailing and complaining and whistling wished and clear, the seven whistlers have passed thy house, Pentron of Porthmere. It was not in the morning, nor the noonday's golden grace. It was in the fearsome midnight when the tide dogs yelped in the race. The tide swings round in the race, and they're whistling wished and low, and they come from the lonely heather where the fur-edged foxgloves blow. And the moor grass sways to and fro, where the yellow moor birds sigh, and the sea cooled wind sweeps by. Canst hear the curlews whistle through the darkness wild and drear, how they're calling, 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 Pentron of Porthmere. Shapes of Doom, Part Two The Victor by Theodosia Garrison. The Live Man Victorious rode spurring from the fight. In a glad voice and glorious, he sang of his delight. And dead men three, footloose and free, came after in the night. And one laid hand on his bridle rein, swift as a steed he sped. Oh, ride you fast, yet at the last, hate faster rides, he said. My son shall know their father's foe one day when blades are red. And one laid hand on his stirrup bar, like touch of driven mist, 
For joy you slew, ere joy I knew, For one girl's mouth unkissed. At your board's head, at mass, at bed, My pale ghost shall persist. And one laid hands on his own two hands, O brother of mine, quoth he, What can I give to you who live Like gift you gave to me? Since from grief and strife and ache a life Your sword strokes set me free. The live man victorious Rode spurring from the fight, In a glad voice and glorious He sang of his delight. And dead men three, footloose and free, Came after in the night. Shapes of Doom, Part Two Mogan of Melwock by Robert Stephen Hawker T'was a fierce night when old Mogan died. Men shuddered to hear the rolling tide. The wreckers fled fast from the awful shore. They had heard strange voices amid the roar. Out with the boat there, someone cried. Will he never come? We shall lose the tide. His berth is trim and his cabin stored. He's a weary long time coming aboard. The old man struggled upon the bed. He knew the words that the voices said. Wildly he shrieked as his eyes grew dim. He was dead. He was dead when I buried him. Hark yet again to the devilish roar. He was nimbler once with a ship on shore. Come, come, old man, to the vain delay. We must make the offing by break of day. Hard was the struggle, but at the last, with a stormy pang old Mogan passed, and away, away beneath their sight gleamed the red sail at pinch of night. Shapes of Doom, Part Two The Mother's Ghost by Henry Wadsworth Longfellow Svenduring he rideth adown the glade, I myself was young. There he has wooed him so winsome a maid, Fair words gladden so many a heart. Together were they for seven years, And together children six were theirs. Then came death abroad the land, And blighted the beautiful lily wand. Sven during he rideth adown the glade, And again hath he wooed him another maid. He hath wooed him a maid and brought home a bride, But she was bitter and full of pride. When she came driving into the yard, There stood the six children, weeping so hard. There stood the small children with sorrowful heart. From before her feet she thrust them apart. She gave to them neither ale nor bread. Ye shall suffer hunger and hate, she said. She took from them their quilts of blue, and said, Ye shall lie on the straw we strew. She took from them the great wax light. Now ye shall lie in the dark at night. In the evening late they cried with cold, the mother heard it under the mold. The woman heard it in the earth below. To my little children I must go. She standeth before the Lord of all, And may I go to my children small? She prayed him so long, and would not cease, Until he bade her depart in peace. At cockcrow thou shalt return again, Longer thou shalt not there remain. She girdeth up her sorrowful bones, And rifted the walls and the marble stones. As through the village she flitted by, the watchdogs howled aloud to the sky. When she came to the castle gate, there stood her eldest daughter in wait. Why standest thou here, dear daughter mine? How fares it with brothers and sisters thine? Never art thou mother of mine, for my mother was both fair and fine. My mother was white, with cheeks of red, but thou art pale and like to the dead. How should I be fair and fine? I have been dead, pale cheeks are mine. How should I be white and red? So long, so long have I been dead. When she came in at the chamber door, There stood the small children, weeping sore. One she braided and one she brushed. The third she lifted, the fourth she hushed. The fifth she took on her lap and pressed, As if she would suckle it at her breast. Then to her eldest daughter said she, do thou bid Svenduring come hither to me. Into the chamber, when he came, she spake to him in anger and shame. I left behind me both ale and bread, my children hunger and are not fed. I left behind me the quilts of blue, my children lie on the straw ye strew. 
I left behind me the great wax light. My children lie in the dark at night. If I come again into your hall, as cruel a fate shall you befall. Now crows the cock with feathers red. Back to the earth must all the dead. Now crows the cock with feathers swart. The gates of heaven fly wide apart. Now crows the cock with feathers white. I can abide no longer tonight. Whenever they heard the watchdog's wail, they gave the children bread and ale. Whenever they heard the watchdog's bay, they feared lest the dead were on their way. Whenever they heard the watchdog's bark, I myself was young. They feared the dead out there in the dark. Fair words gladden so many a heart. Shapes of Doom, Part 2 The Dead Mother by Robert Buchanan As I lay asleep, as I lay asleep, Under the grass as I lay so deep, As I lay asleep in my cotton cirque, Under the shade of Our Lady's kirk, I wakened up in the dead of night, I wakened up in my death cirque white, And I heard a cry from far away, and I knew the voice of my daughter May. Mother, mother, come hither to me. Mother, mother, come hither and see. Mother, mother, mother dear, another mother is sitting here. My body is bruised and in pain I cry. On straw in the dark, afraid I lie. I thirst and hunger for drink and meat. And mother, mother, to sleep were sweet. I heard the cry, though my grave was deep, and awoke from sleep, and awoke from sleep. I awoke from sleep, I awoke from sleep. Up I rose from my grave so deep. The earth was black, but overhead the stars were yellow, the moon was red. And I walked along all white and thin, and lifted the latch and entered in and reached the chamber as dark as night, and though it was dark, my face was white. Mother, mother, I look on thee. Mother, mother, you frighten me, for your cheeks are thin and your hair is gray. But I smiled and kissed her fears away. I smoothed her hair, and I sang a song, and on my knee I rocked her long. Oh, mother, mother, sing low to me, I am sleepy now, and I cannot see. I kissed her, but I could not weep. And she went to sleep, and she went to sleep. As we lay asleep, as we lay asleep. My May and I in our grave so deep, As we lay asleep in the midnight murk, Under the shade of Our Lady's kirk. I awakened up in the dead of night, Though May my daughter lay warm and white. For I heard the cry of a little one, and I knew t'was the voice of Hugh, my son. Mother, mother, come hither to me. Mother, mother, come hither and see. Mother, mother, mother dear, another mother is sitting here. My body is bruised and my heart is sad, but I speak my mind and call them bad. I thirst and hunger night and day. And were I strong, I would fly away. I heard the cry, though my grave was deep, And awoke from sleep, and awoke from sleep. I awoke from sleep, I awoke from sleep, Up I rose from my grave so deep. The earth was black, but overhead The stars were yellow, the moon was red, And I walked along all white and thin, And lifted the latch and entered in. Mother, mother, and art thou here? I know your face, and I feel no fear. Raise me, mother, and kiss my cheek, For, oh, I am weary and sore and weak. I smoothed his hair with a mother's joy, And he laughed aloud, my own brave boy. I raised and held him on my breast, Sang him a song, and bade him rest. Mother, mother, sing low to me. I am sleepy now, and I cannot see. I kissed him, and I could not weep, as he went to sleep, as he went to sleep. 
and as I lay asleep, as I lay asleep, with my girl and boy in my grave so deep, as I lay asleep, I awoke in fear, awoke, but awoke not my children dear, and I heard a cry so low and weak from a tiny voice that could not speak. I heard the cry of a little one, my bairn that could neither talk nor run, my little, little one, uncaressed, starving for lack of the milk of the breast. And I rose from sleep and entered in, and found my little one pinched and thin, and crooned a song and hushed its moan, and put its lips to my white breast bone. And the red, red moon that lit the place went white to look at the little face. And I kissed and kissed, and I could not weep as it went to sleep, as it went to sleep. As it lay asleep, as it lay asleep, I set it down in the darkness deep, smoothed its limbs and laid it out, and drew the curtains round about. Then into the dark, dark room I hide, where he lay awake at the woman's side. And though the chamber was black as night, he saw my face, for it was so white. I gazed in his eyes, and he shrieked in pain, and I knew he would never sleep again. And back to my grave went silently, and soon my baby was brought to me. My son and daughter beside me rest. My little baby is on my breast. Our bed is warm and our grave is deep, but he cannot sleep. He cannot sleep. End of section 21. Recording by E.J. Wiley. Section 22 of The Haunted Hour, an anthology by Margaret Whittemer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. Legends and Ballads of the Dead, Part 1 The Folk of the Air, by William Butler Yeats O Driscoll drove with a song, the wild duck and the drake, from the tall and the tufted weeds of the drear heart lake and he saw how the weeds grew dark at the coming of night tide and he dreamed of the long dark hair of bridget his bride he heard while he sang and dreamed a piper passing away and never was piping so sad and never was piping so gay and he saw young men and young girls who danced on a level place, and Bridget his bride among them, with a sad and a gay face. The dancers crowded about him, and many a sweet thing said, and a young man brought him red wine, and a young girl white bread. But Bridget drew him by the sleeve, away from the merry bands, to old men playing at cards, with a twinkling of ancient hands. The bread and the wine had a doom, for these were the folk of the air. He sat and played in a dream of her long, dim hair. He played with the merry old men and thought not of evil chance until one bore Bridget his bride away from the merry dance. He bore her away in his arms, the handsomest young man there, and his neck and his breast and his arms were drowned in her long, dim hair. O Driscoll got up from the grass and scattered the cards with a cry, but the old men and the dancers were gone as a cloud faded into the sky. He knew now the folk of the air, and his heart was blackened by dread, and he ran to the door of his house. Old women were keening the dead, and he heard high up in the air a piper piping away and never was piping so sad, and never was piping so gay. The Reconciliation by A. Margaret Ramsay The snow has ceased, the wind is hushed, the moon shines fair and clear, the night is drawing on apace, 
yet evan is not here the deer is couched among the fern the bird sleeps on the tree oh what can keep my only son he bides so long from me oh mother come and take your rest since evan stays so late if we leave the door unbarred for him what need to sit and wait now hold your peace my daughter be still and let me be i will not seek my bed this night until my son i see and she has left the door unbarred and by the fire sat still she drew her mantle her about as the winter night grew chill the moon had set beyond the moor and half the night had gone when standing silent by her side she saw evan her son i did not hear your step evan nor hear you lift the pin i would not wake my sister mother so softly i came in now sit ye down and rest evan and i will give you meat i have been with my cousin john mother and he gave me to eat then have ye laid the quarrel by that was twixt him and you and given each other pledge of faith you will be friends anew we have laid the quarrel by mother forevermore to sleep and he has given me his knife as pledge of faith to keep oh is it blood or is it rust that makes the knife so red or is it but the red firelight that's shining on the blade no rust is on the blade mother nor the firelight's ruddy hue the bright blood ran upon the knife to seal our compact true oh is it with a pale gray gleam that comes before the dawn or are you weary with the road that ye look so ghastly wan a long and weary road mother i fared to reach my home and i must get me to my bed that waits for me to come the night is bitter cold evan see that your bed be warm and take your plaid to cover you lest the cold should do you harm yes cold cold is the night mother yet soundly do i rest with a bleak north wind to cover me and the snow white on my breast the priest's brother by dora sigerson shorter thrice in the night the priest arose from broken sleep to kneel and pray hush poor ghost till the red cock crows and i a mass for your soul may say thrice he went to the chamber cold where stiff and still uncoffined his brother lay his beads he told and rest poor spirit rest he said thrice lay the old priest down to sleep before the morning bell should toll but still he heard and woke to weep the crying of his brother's soul all through the dark till dawn was pale the priest tossed in his misery with muffled ears to hide the wail the voice of that ghost's agony at last the red cock flaps his wings to trumpet of a day new-born the lark awaking soaring sings into the bosom of the morn the priest before the altar stands he hears the spirit call for peace he beats his breast with shaking hands o oh, father grant the soul's release most just and merciful set free from purgatory's awful night the sinner's soul to fly to thee and rest forever in thy sight the mass is over still the clerk kneels pallid in the morning glow he said from evils of the dark oh bless me father ere you go benediction that i may rest for all night did the banshee weep the priest raised up his hands and blessed go now my child and you will sleep the priest went down the vestry stair he laid his vestments in their place and turned a pale ghost met him there with beads of pain upon his face brother he said you have gained me peace but why so long did you know my tears and say no mass for my soul's release to save the torture of those years god rest you brother the good priest said no years have passed but a single night 
he showed the body uncoffined and the six wax candles still light the living flowers on the dead man's breast blew out a perfume sweet and strong the spirit paused ere he passed to rest god save your soul from a night so long end of section twenty two section twenty three of the haunted hour an anthology by margaret widmer this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. recording by nemo legends and ballads of the dead part two the ballad of judas iscariot by robert buchanan twas the body of judas iscariot lay in the field of blood twas the soul of judas iscariot beside the body stood black was the earth by night and black was the sky black black were the broken clouds though the red moon went by twas the body of judas iscariot strangled and dead lay there twas the soul of judas iscariot looked on in its despair the breath of the world came and went like a sick man's in rest drop by drop on the world's eyes the dews fell cool and blessed then the soul of judas iscariot did make a gentle moan i will bury underneath the ground my flesh and blood and bone i will bury it deep beneath the soil lest mortals look thereon and when the wolf and raven come my body will be gone the stones of the field are sharp as steel and hard and cold god wot and i must bear my body hence until i find a spot twas the soul of judas iscariot so grim and gaunt and gray raised the body of judas iscariot and carried it away and as he bare it from the field its touch was cold as ice and the ivory teeth within the jaw rattled loud like dice as the soul of judas iscariot carried its load with pain the eye of heaven like a lantern's eye opened and shut again half he walked and half he seemed lifted on the cold wind he did not turn for chilling hands were pushing from behind the first place that he came unto it was the open wold and underneath were prickly winds and a wind that blew so cold the next place that he came unto it was a stagnant pool and when he threw the body in it floated light as wool he drew the body on his back and it was dripping chill and the next place that he came on to was a cross upon a hill a cross upon the windy hill and a cross on either side three skeletons that swung thereon who had been crucified and on the middle crossbar sat a white dove slumbering dim it sat in the dim light with its head beneath its wing and underneath the middle cross a grave yawned wide and vast but the soul of judas iscariot shivered and glided past the fourth place that he came on to it was the brig of dread and the great torrents rushing down were deep and swift and red he dared not fling the body in for fear of faces dim and arms were waved in the wild water to thrust it back to him Twas the soul of Judas Iscariot turned from the brig of dread, and the dreadful foam of the wild water had splashed the body red. For days and nights he wandered on upon an open plain, and the days went by like blinding mist, and the nights like rushing rain. For days and nights he wandered on all through the wood of woe, and the nights went by like the moaning wind and the days like drifting snow twas the soul of judas iscariot came with a weary face 
alone alone and all alone alone in a lonely place he wandered east and he wandered west and heard no human sound for months and years in grief and tears he wandered round and round for months and years in grief and tears he walked the silent night then the soul of judas iscariot perceived a far-off light a far-off light across the waste as dim as dim might be that came and went like a lighthouse gleam on a black night at sea twas the soul of judas iscariot crawled to the distant gleam and the rain came down and the rain was blown against him with a scream for days and nights he wandered on pushed on by hands unseen and the days went by like black black rain and the nights like rushing rain twas the soul of judas iscariot strange and sad and tall stood all alone at the dead of night before a lighted hall and all the wold was white with snow and his footmarks black and damp and the ghost of the silver moon arose holding her yellow lamp and the icicles were on the eaves and the walls were deep with white and the shadows of the guests within passed on the window light and the shadows of the wedding guest did strangely come and go and the body of judas iscariot lay stretched along the snow the body of judas iscariot lay stretched along the snow twas the soul of judas iscariot ran swiftly to and fro to and fro and up and down he ran so swiftly there as round and round the frozen pole glideth the lean white bear twas the bridegroom sat at the table head and the lights burned bright and clear oh who is there the bridegroom said whose weary feet i hear twas one looked up from the lighted hall and answered soft and low it is a wolf runs up and down with a black track in the snow the bridegroom in his robe of white sat at the table head oh who is that who moans without the blessed bridegroom said twas one looked from the lighted hall and answered fierce and low twas the soul of judas iscariot gliding to and fro twas the soul of judas iscariot did hush itself and stand and saw the bridegroom at the door with a light in his hand the bridegroom stood in the open door and he was clad in white and far within the lord's supper was spread so long and bright the bridegroom shaded his eyes and looked and his face was bright to see what dost thou hear at the lord's supper with thy body's sins said he twas the soul of judas iscariot stood black and sad and bare i have wandered many nights and days there is no light elsewhere twas the wedding guest cried out within and their eyes were fierce and bright scourge the soul of judas iscariot away into the night the bridegroom stood in the open door and he waved hands still and slow and the third time that he waved his hands the air was full of snow and of every flake of falling snow before it touched the ground there came a dove and a thousand doves made sweet sound twas the body of judas iscariot floated away full fleet and the wings of the doves that bear it off were like its winding sheet twas the bridegroom stood at the open door and beckoned smiling sweet twas the soul of judas iscariot stole in and fell at his feet the holy supper spread within and the many candles shine and i have waited long for thee before i poured the wine the supper wine is poured at last and the lights burn bright and fair iscariot washes the bridegroom's feet and dries them with his hair end of section 23
Section 24 of The Haunted Hour, an anthology by Margaret Wiedemer. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Nemo. Legends and Ballads of the Dead, Part 3 the eve of st john by walter scott the baron of smelome rose with the day he spurred his courser on without stop or stay down the rocky way that leads to brotherstone he went not with the bold buccleu his banner broad to rear he went not gainst the english hue to lift the scottish spear yet his plate-jack was braced and his helmet was laced and his vaunt brace of proof he wore at his saddle girth was a good steel spurth full ten pound weight and more the baron returned in three days space and his looks were sad and sour and weary was his courser's pace as he reached his rocky tower he came not from where ancramor ran red with english blood where the douglas true and the bold buccleu gainst keen lord ever stood yet was his helmet hacked and hewed his action pierced and tore his axe and his dagger with blood imbrued but it was not english gore he lighted at the chapel age he held him close and still and he whistled thrice for his little foot page his name was english will come thou hither my little foot page come hither to my knee though thou art young and tender of age i think thou art true to me come tell me all that thou hast seen and look thou tell me true since i from smell home tower have been what did my lady do my lady each night sought the lonely light that burns on the wild watch fold for from height to height the beacons bright of the english foemen told the bittern clamoured from the moss the wind blew loud and shrill yet the craggy pathway she did cross to the eyry beacon hill i watched her steps and silent came where she sat her on a stone no watchman stood by the dreary flame it burned all alone the second night i kept her in sight till to the fire she came and by mary's might an armed knight stood by the lonely flame and many a word that warlike lord did speak to my lady there but the rain fell fast and loud blew the blast and i heard not what they were the third night there the night was fair and the mountain blast was still as again i watched the secret pair on the lonesome beacon hill and I heard her name the midnight hour, and name this holy eve, and say, Come this night to the lady's bower, ask no bold baron's leave. He lifts his spear with a bold buccleu, his lady is all alone, the door shall undo to her knight so true, on the eve of the good St. John. I cannot come, I must not come, I dare not come to thee. On the eve of St. John, I must wander alone, in thy bower I may not be. Now, out on thee, faint-hearted knight, thou shouldst not say me nay, for the eve is sweet, and when lovers meet, is worth the whole summer's day. And I'll chain the bloodhound, and the warder shall not sound, and rushes shall be strewed on the stair. So by the black rude stone, by holy saint john i conjure thee my love to be there though the bloodhound be mute and the rush beneath my foot and the water his bugle should not blow yet there sleepeth a priest in a chamber to the east and my footstep he would know o oh, fear not the priest who sleepeth to the east for to dryburg the way he is ta'en and there to say mass till three days to pass for the soul of a knight that is slain he turned him around and grimly he frowned then he laughed right scornfully 
he who says the mass right for the soul of that night may as well say mass for me at the lone midnight hour when bad spirits have power in thy chamber will i be with that he was gone and my lady left alone and no more did i see then changed i trow was that bold baron's brow from the dark to the blood-red high now tell me the mean of the night thou hast seen for by mary he shall die his arms shone full bright in the beacon's red light his plume it was scarlet and blue and his shield was a hound in a silver leash bound and his crest was a branch of the yew thou liest thou liest thou little foot page loud dost thou lie to me for that night is cold and laid in the mould all under the eildon tree yet hear but my word my noble lord for i heard her name his name and that lady bright she called the knight sir richard of coldingham the bold baron's brow then changed i trow from the high blood red to pale the grave is deep and dark and the corpse is stiff and stark so i may not trust thy tale where fair tweed flows round holy melrose and eildon slopes to the plain full three nights ago by some secret foe that gay gallant was slain the varying light deceived thy sight and the wild winds drowned the name for the dryburg bells ring and the white monks do sing for sir richard of coldingham he passed the court gate and he opened the tower gate and he mounted the narrow stair to the bartisan seat where with maids that on her wait he found his lady fair that lady sat in mournful mood looked o'er hill and vale over tweed's fair flood and murk town's wood and all down tevet tail now hail now hail thou lady bright now hail thou baron true what news what news from ancrum fight what news from the bold buccleu the ancrum moor is red with gore for many a southron fell and buccleu has charged us evermore to watch our beacons well the lady blushed red but nothing she said nor added the baron a word then she stepped down the stair to her chamber fair and so did her moody lord in sleep the lady mourned and the baron tossed and turned and oft to himself he said the worms round him creep and his bloody grave is deep it cannot give up the dead it was near the ringing of mat and bell the night was well nigh done when a heavy sleep on that baron fell on the eve of good st john the lady looked through the chamber fair by the light of the dying flame and she was aware of a knight stood there sir richard of coldingham alas away away she cried for the holy virgin's sake lady i know who sleeps by thy side but lady he will not wake by eildon tree for long nights three and bloody grave have i lain the mass and the death prayer are said for me but lady they are said in vain by the baron's brand near tweed's fair strand most foully slain i fell and my restless sprite on the beacon's height for a space is doomed to dwell at our trysting place for a certain space i must wander to and fro but i had not had power to come to thy bower hadst thou not conjured me so love mastered fear her brow she crossed how richard hast thou sped and art thou saved or art thou lost the vision shook his head who spilleth life shall forfeit life so bid thy lord believe that lawless love is guilt above this awful sign receive he laid his left hand on an oaken beam his right upon her hand the lady shrunk and fainting sunk for it scorched like a fiery brand the sable score of fingers four remains on that board impressed and forevermore that lady wore a covering on her wrist there is a nun in dryburg bower ne'er looks upon the sun 
there is a monk in melrose tower he speaketh word to none that none who ne'er beholds the day that monk that speaks to none that none with smalhome's lady gay that monk the bold baron fair margaret's misfortunes by anonymous i am no love for you margaret you are no love for me for tomorrow at eight of the clock a rich wedding you shall see fair margaret sat in her bower window combing her yellow hair there she espied sweet william and his bride as they were a riding near down she laid her ivory comb and up she bound her hair she went away out of her bower and never returned there when day was gone and night was come and all men fast to sleep there came the spirit of fair margaret and stood at william's feet are you awake sweet william she said or william are you asleep god give you joy of your gay bride bed and me of my winding sheet when day was come and night was gone and all men waked in from sleep sweet william to his lady said alas i've cause to weep i dreamt a dream my dear lady such dreams are never good i dreamt my bower was full of red swine and the walls ran down with blood he called up his merrymen all by one by two and by three saying all away to fair margaret's bower by the leave of my lady and when he came to fair margaret's bower he knocked at the ring and who so ready as her seven brethren to let sweet william in he turned down the covering sheet to see the face of the dead methinks she looks all pale and wan she hath lost her cherry red i would do more for thee margaret than would any of thy kin and i will kiss thy pale cold lips though a smile i cannot win with that bespake the seven brethren making most piteous moan you may go and kiss your jolly brown bride and let our sister alone if i do kiss my jolly brown bride i do but what is right i ne'er made a vow to yonder poor corpse by day nor yet by night deal on deal on ye merry men all deal on your cake and wine whatever is dealt at her funeral to-day shall be dealt to-morrow at mine fair margaret died as it might be to-day sweet william he died the morrow fair margaret died for pure true love sweet william he died for sorrow margaret was buried in the lower chancel and william in the higher and out of her breast there sprang a rose tree and out of his a briar they grew till they grew unto the church top and when they could grow no higher and there they tied a true lover's knot which made all the people admire at last the clerk of the parish came as the truth doth well appear and by misfortune he cut them down or else they had now been here End of section 24section twenty five of the haunted hour an anthology by margaret wiedemer this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by nemo legends and ballads of the dead part four sweet william's ghost by anonymous there came a ghost to marjorie's door with many a grievous moan and aye he turled at the pin but answer made she none oh say is that my father or is't my brother john or is it my true love willie from scotland new come home tis not thy father marjorie nor not thy brother john but tis thy true love willie from scotland new come home o oh, marjorie sweet o oh, marjorie dear for faith and charity will ye give me back my faith and troth 
that I gave once to thee, thy faith and troth thou gavest to me, and again thou'lt never win, until thou come within my bower, and kiss me cheek and chin. My lips they are say bitter, he says, my breath it is say strang, if ye get a kiss from me to-night, your days will not be lang. The cocks are crying, Marjorie, the cocks are crying again, the dead we the quick they must not stay and i must needs be gone she followed him high she followed him low till she came to yon churchyard green and there the deep grave opened up and young william he lay down what three things are these sweet william that stand beside your head oh it's three maidens marjorie that once i promised to wed what three things are these sweet william that stand so close at your side oh it's three babes he says marjorie that these three maidens had what three things are these sweet william that lie close at thy feet oh it's three hell hounds marjorie that's waiting my soul to keep and she took up her white white hand and struck him on the breast saying have here again thy faith and troth and i wish your soul good rest Clerk Saunders by Anonymous Clerk Saunders and May Margaret walked our young garden green, and deep and heavy was the love that fell their twa between. A bed, a bed, Clerk Saunders said, a bed for you and me. Fie na, fie na, said May Margaret, till ains we married be. But I'll take the sword frae my scabbard and slowly lift the pin and you may swear and save your eighth ye ne'er let clerk saunders in take your napkin in your hand tie up your bonny een and you may swear and save your eighth you saw me na since your strain it was about the midnight hour when they asleep were laid when in and came her seven brothers with torches burning red when in and came her seven brothers with torches burning bright they said, We hae but one sister, and behold her lying with a knight. Then out and spake the first o' them, We will awa and let them be. And out and spake the second o' them, His father his ne'er mea but he. And out and spake the third o' them, I wot that they are lovers dear. And out and spake the fourth o' them, They hae been in love this mony a year. Then out and spake the fifth o' them, it were great sin true love to twain and out and spake the sixth o' them it were shame to slay a sleeping man then up and gat the seventh o' them and never a word spake he but he has striped his bright brown brand out through clerk saunders fair body clerk saunders he started and margaret she turned into his arms as asleep she lay and sad and silent was the night that was atween the twa and they lay still and sleep it sound until the day began to daw and kindly she to him did say it is time true love you are awa but he lay still and sleep it sound albeit the sun began to sheen she looked between her and the wa and dull and drowsy were his een then in and came her father dear said let a your morning be i'll carry the dead corpse to the clay and i'll come back and comfort thee comfort weel your seven sons for comforted i will never be i trow twas neither knave nor loon was in the bower last night wi me the clinking bell gaed through the town and carried the dead corpse to the clay young saunders stood at may margaret's window i wot an hour before the day are ye sleeping margaret he says or are you waking presently Give me my faith and troth again, true love, as I guide them to thee. Your faith and troth ye shall never get, nor our true love shall never twin, until ye come within my bower and kiss me cheek and chin. My mouth it is full cold, Margaret, it has the smell now of the ground, and if I may kiss thy comely mouth, thy days will soon be at an end. Oh, cocks are crowing a merry midnight, I wot the wild fowls are boding day give me my faith and troth again 
and let me fare me on my way thy faith and troth thou shalt na get and our true loves all never twin until ye tell wha comes o woman what ye who die in strong travelling their beds are made in the heavens high down at the foot of our good lord's knee we'll set about with gilly flowers i wot sweet company for to see o oh, cocks are crowing a merry midnight i wot the wild fowls are boding day the psalms of heaven will soon be sung and i ere now will be missed away then she has taken a chrism wand and she has stroken her troth thereon she has given it him out at the shot window with mony a sad sigh and heavy groan i thank ye margaret i thank ye margaret ever i thank ye heartily but gin i were living as i am dead i'd keep my faith and troth with thee it's hosen and shoon and gown alone she climbed the wall and followed him till she came to the green forest and there she lost the sight of him is there ony room at your head saunders is there ony room at your feet is there ony room at your side saunders where fain fain i would sleep there's nae room at my head margaret there's nae room at my feet my bed it is full lowly now among the hungry worms i sleep cod mould is my covering now but in my winding sheet the dew it fall nay sooner down than my resting place is wheat then up and crew the red red cock then up and crew the grey tis time tis time my dear margaret that you were going away and fair margaret and rare margaret and margaret o oh, verity gin ere ye love another man ne'er love him as ye did me the wife of usher's well by anonymous there lived a wife at usher's well and a wealthy wife was she she had three stout and stalwart sons and sent them o'er the sea they had na been a week from her a week but barely ain when word cam to the carlin wife that her three sons were gain they had na been a week from her a week but barely three when word cam to the carlin wife that her son she'd never see i wish the wind may never cease nor fish be in the flood till my three sons came hame to me in earthly flesh and blood it fell about the martin mass when nights are lang and murk the carlin wife's three sons came hame and their hats were o the burk if neither grew in shine or ditch nor yet in any small shuff but at the gates o paradise that burk grew fair enough blow up the fire my maidens bring water from the well for ah my house shall feast this night since my three sons are well and she has made them to a bed she's made it large and wide and she's ta'en her mantle round about sat down at the bedside up then crew the red red cock and up and crew the grey the eldest to the youngest said tis time we were away the cock doth craw the day doth daw the chiner and worm doth chide can we be missed out o' our place a sair pain we maun bide lie still lie still but a little wee while lie still but if we may keen my mother should miss us when she wakes she'll go mad ere it be the day our mother has nae mare but us see where she leans asleep the mantle that was on herself she has hopped it round our feet oh it's they have ta'en up their mother's mantle and they've hung it on a pin o oh, lang may ye hing my mother's mantle ere ye hap us again fare ye weel my mother dear fare weel to bawn and byre and fare ye weel the bonny lass that kindles my mother's fire a like wake dirge by anonymous this i night this i night every night and all fire and sleet and candle light and christ receive thy soul when thou from hence away art past every night and all to winnie moor thou comest at last and christ 
receive thy soul if ever thou givest hosen and shoon every night and all sit thee down and put them on and christ receive thy soul if hosen and shoon thou ne'er gavest nain every night and all the wind shall prick thee to the bare bane and christ receive thy soul from windy moor when thou mayst pass every night and all to brig or dread thou comest at last and christ receive thy soul from brig or dread when thou mayst pass every night and all to purgatory far thou comest at last and christ receive thy soul if ever thou givest meat or drink every night and all the fire shall never make thee shrink and christ receive thy soul if meat or drink thou never gavest nain every night and all the fire will burn thee to the bare bane and christ receive thy soul this a night this a night every night and all fire and sleet and candlelight and christ receive thy soul end of section twenty five end of the haunted hour an anthology by margaret widmer